morning, everybody. We'd like to uh, start with our intro remarks and rules of the road in about two minutes. So if you got about two minute warning to go ahead and settle down, go get your coffee or use the restroom or whatever you got to do. Thanks. Free drinks. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and start our introduction. We have a, a, an action-packed uh, session for you this morning, and we don't want to cut into the speaker's time at all. So um, first of all, uh, we want to welcome you here. It's great to see a nice audience this morning for the first of our two marquee sessions here at the 50th LPSC. Uh, this morning's session is 50 Years of Lunar Science, The Legacy of One Small Step. My name is Dave Draper. I'm the Astromaterials Manager at NASA Johnson Space Center and um, uh, here in Houston, uh, co-chair of the Program Committee for LPSC. And my counterpart this morning is Lunar and Planetary Institute's Director, Louise Proctor, co-convener of the conference. Um, we've been planning the 50th LPSC for quite some time, uh, including arranging for the spectacular weather we have this week. Although the fire was not well, something that we, although it's out this morning, so that's really good news. Uh, we're really delighted to see everyone here. It's a, a, we've got a record-breaking attendance at the, at the meeting, record-breaking number of abstracts submitted to the conference, and uh, we're just uh, really thrilled that everything's worked out this way, despite some of the hiccups during the government shutdown that uh, happened while we were trying to compile the program. Also want to remind you to please attend this afternoon's companion marquee session, 50 Years of Planetary Science, One a Giant Leap for Mankind. Uh, we have a really great lineup of speakers here for you this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have viewed this 50th LPSC as a look forward, um, a passing of the torch kind of a milestone as our community has evolved over the decades since Apollo. And what better time than the 50th LPSC to not just look back on the past accomplishments, which are awesome, but to set the stage for the next 50 years. And uh, JSC, it turns out, has recently adopted some, some new branding. And a, a new motto we have at JSC is giant leaps start here. And so similarly, uh, giant leaps are starting right here at the 50th LPSC. And so in keeping with this notion, we took the approach uh, in formulating this session in, on focusing and emphasizing scientists who are currently leading the charge in lunar science and who will be the leaders in the decades to come. And we feel that doing so is particularly appropriate right now, given NASA's renewed emphasis on the moon, uh, which complements that interest on the part of virtually all the other spacefaring nations. So accordingly, we have asked this morning's speakers, most of whom uh, come from that uh, section of our community, to use the legacy of Apollo as the starting point for their emphasis on what's happening now and what's likely to be important in this exciting new future. All in 11 minutes with four minutes for questions and answers. No pressure. Okay. So um, with that, let me just remind everybody of the rules of the road as, as we uh, navigate through our sessions uh, here at LPSC. Um, the timing of the talks we're going to uh, very strictly adhere to. It's nine minutes for your, the bulk of your presentation. Your light will be green uh, during the nine minutes. Uh, it will then change to yellow for the following two minutes, and then it will change to red, and that is when you really need to be done. So at the two-minute warning, please start wrapping up, and we want to see your conclusion slide on the screen as the red light uh, goes on. If it starts blinking, that's a bad thing. Don't make me come over there. That's all I can say. <clears throat> um, uh, as is customary, when you want to ask a question, please go to the microphones in the center aisle of the room and, and please introduce yourself by name and institution. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also ask speakers to uh, be ready for their talk by going over to the AV table here uh, and getting mic'd up uh, in the uh, uh, end of the talk prior to yours. 
Um, unlike all the other sessions at LPSC, today, this morning's session and the afternoon's session will be live streamed. So in case speakers didn't know that, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, but as a consequence, uh, we always ask our speakers to stay on the podium just so there's no microphone feedback issues. But in particular today, stay on the podium so you can stay in the shot and so our, our intrepid uh, camera operators back there don't have to try to track you. Um, and audience, uh, I see people are filtering in. Please come on in. There's still plenty of chairs. Uh, let's not try, uh, block the doors uh, in case there's any issues here. Um, we ask everyone, including the speakers, to please silence your devices. Uh, remind everyone, Thursday posters can be put up uh, today. Uh, you can go do that anytime you like. Uh, also, a reminder for the, the lunar community here that the League Town Hall will be held at lunchtime today. That is in uh, Waterway 1 through 3. Uh, we will also have to be sure we clear this room promptly after the last talk because there is uh, another advisory group uh, uh, town hall meeting in here starting at 12 noon. So we'll want to, we'll want to uh, get out in a timely fashion. A couple of last reminders before we start. Uh, uh, in Waterway 4-5, this room plus the one next door, a giant map of the moon compiled from uh, stunning uh, LROC images will be uh, laid out on the floor. You can walk on the moon. Um, you can't wear shoes, however, because it's, uh, you'll damage uh, the, the, the flooring. And as some of you may know, there's a thing, socks of LPSC. Tonight is your chance to strut your socks. And then finally, please don't forget the free screening of the spectacular uh, film Apollo 11 that was recently released. It's being shown over across the street at the uh, cinema in the mall. There's only, about, I think, about 100 tickets. It's free. It's first come, first serve. Tickets will be starting to be handed out at 7 p.m. with showtime at 7.30 p.m. And speaking of showtime, we are on time. Let's go. Our very first speaker this morning <clears throat> excuse me, is Robin Knup. And the title of her presentation is Lunar Origin by Giant Impact, an Evolving Legacy of Apollo. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of these sessions and for the invitation to give this talk. I'm deeply honored. Thank you. An important scientific outcome of the Apollo program was a new idea for the formation of the moon. The giant impact theory imagines that the moon accumulated from ejecta placed into orbit around the Earth as a result of a large collision with our planet at the end of its formation. The impact theory is favored in general because it can uniquely explain some of the main properties of the Earth-Moon system, including the moon's lack of iron if the debris originates primarily from the outer layers of these planets, the early rapid spin of the Earth, and we think from our planet formation models that these types of large collisions were commonplace in our solar system in a time frame consistent with the ages of the oldest lunar rocks. The so-called canonical impact involves a roughly mars size impactor, which I'll call Theia. And this collision produces a planeted disk system that is consistent with the masses of the Earth and the Moon, the moon's iron depletion, and the current angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system. So if this were a typical problem in astrophysics, where we only view objects from afar, we'd think this was the answer. We'd think we were done. So what makes moon origin such a fascinating problem to work on is that, of course, we don't just have remote sensing of these objects. We have the samples. And it's the properties of those samples, in particular the compositional relationship between the Earth and Moon, that has driven work on lunar origin over the last 10 years. The crux of the issue is this. We know from now many thousands of simulations of giant collisions that in most cases, the debris that ends up in orbit around the Earth originates oops, predominantly from the impacting object, Theia, rather than the proto-Earth. Now, we don't know what the composition of Theia was, but we know what the composition of Mars is. And if Theia was as different from Earth as Mars is, and the disk formed from Theia, we would expect the Earth and Moon to have measurable isotopic differences. And yet, across many elements, including oxygen, the Earth and Moon are isotopically identical. So what we've been focused on is trying to explain how 
we can merge these two independently formed planets through a giant impact and end up with a moon and Earth that look isotopically identical. And so I'm going to go through uh, some of the main ideas for how this can be accomplished. Perhaps the simplest idea is that Theia itself may have also been isotopically Earth-like. Current estimates suggest that for most elements, this is not probable, but not too improbable either that uh, with a probability of order five to perhaps of order tens of percent of the time, Theia would look Earth-like by virtue of having formed nearby the Earth or perhaps due to the Earth's uh, primary accretion being due to material that has an enstatite chondrite-like isotopic composition. But the real fly in the ointment to this explanation is the element tungsten. Recent works infer that the Earth and Moon had equal tungsten isotopic compositions, and this is much more challenging to explain because tungsten depends critically on the timing of core formation in both the proto-Earth and Theia. So that even if you start with a disk that is Earth-like in other elements, which is the case considered here, estimates suggest it would be very improbable for Theia and Earth to also have the needed tungsten composition to produce this initial tungsten match. Another idea is equilibration. This imagines that initially the disk and the Earth had different compositions, but that before the moon formed, they mixed and equilibrated their compositions. This is a very appealing idea because it offers a way to explain the isotopic similarity between the Earth and the moon across many elements through a single process. But it's a complex process, and we don't yet understand how efficient it would have been and in particular, whether it would have occurred efficiently at the distances of three Earth radii or more at which the moon accumulates. In addition, if this mixing were due to, say, convection in the vapor phases, you might expect the Earth and moon to have retained differences in their isotopic composition in refractory elements that had been concentrated in the melt. But instead, the Earth and moon look identical in titanium and have only a small difference in their calcium composition. A fundamental advance was made by Macha Chuk and his colleagues when they used dynamical models to show that there are interactions with the sun that can change the angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system by a large amount after the moon formed. And these opened up the possibility that the moon forming impact could have been a much higher angular momentum impact than we previously considered. Now, there have been a variety of high angular momentum impacts proposed. My personal favorite, I am not impartial on this, this was the impact I proposed in 2012, uh, is what's called the half-Earth impact. In this idea, Theia and the proto-Earth are similar in size. And this symmetry means that even if they had different comp compositions, that in the end, the final planet and the disk each have similar fractions of impactor and target material, so they have very similar compositions. The plot on the right shows a simulation from Locke et al., who examined the evolution of a highly vaporized structure produced by these types of impacts called a synestia. And one of the advantages of the half-Earth impact is it makes a very massive disk, so you can condense a lunar moon, a lunar mass moon, from the outer disk, even if inner disk accretion is inefficient. However, we still don't know how probable these types of collisions would have been or the angular momentum removal needed uh, to make them consistent with our current system. And tungsten remains uh, a sticking point for these collisions as well. Finally, a new idea that perhaps the moon was the result of multiple impacts that we think would have occurred as the Earth accreted. So the idea here is that each impact created a moonlet that tidally evolved, and these moonlets merged to form the final moon. When you form the moon from multiple impacts, the difference compositionally between the Earth and the moon is decreased compared to forming the moon through one stochastic impact. But the challenge here is that moonlets produced by subsequent impacts may not always merge. In addition, if the moon grows alongside the Earth, there is the risk that it may have become contaminated by iron-rich material as it formed. So where are we? When the impact theory was first proposed, there was a concern that you might have to have a very specific type of impact to form a satellite. The opposite is now clearly the case. We know that most low-velocity collisions that allow the planet to grow 
if they're large, will also produce disks and moons. This would have been a common process in planet formation in our system and in others, we think. We also now know there's not just one type of impact that can form our moon. We have lots of different scenarios that we think are all plausible, way to, plausible ways to get to our Earth-Moon system. So going forward, I'm going to uh, go through in the final slides of my talk some of the areas that I think could benefit from future work. Fu um, first, uh, whoops, models that uh, relate these different origin ideas that invoke very different impact energies and impact histories to observable properties of the moon that will allow these ideas to be tested, uh, new constraints and data that we'll hopefully be able to access through planned uh, lunar exploration, and scrutiny of key aspects of the origin scenarios. So we'd really like to have models that relate this initial melt and vapor ejecta produced by the impact to the formation of the moon itself. Uh, this is a very complex problem and one on which great advances have been made in recent years by many groups. But we'd still like to have models that include all of the important first order dynamical and thermodynamical effects to answer several key questions that remain debated. For example, the efficiency and time scale of moon accretion that relates to how this ejecta cools and the radial mass transport in the disk, the predicted chemistry of the moon and its volatile content, which requires uh, knowledge of how the vapor in the disk will move relative to the melt from which the moon forms, and the likelihood of this mixing and equilibration that I mentioned earlier. In terms of new data, I'm going to highlight uh, two things that would be of particular interest to the origin models. First is the degree to which the moon was initially melted. Grail data suggest that the moon had an outer magma ocean, of course, consistent with Apollo results, but that its interior was colder, that it was subsolidus. This is a very constraining state, and by that I mean it's difficult to achieve for the giant impact models. Most of them would predict a fully molten moon, and we hope that a future seismic and heat flow network will shed additional uh, constraints on this issue. We'd like to better understand the moon's bulk composition, how it relates to the Earth, and its volatile content. Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? And hopefully we'll get more information uh, on this from additional lunar glasses that have been so critical to our understanding of the moon's composition, and potentially to sampling a sample of the um, lunar mantle that may be exposed near the largest lunar basins. Finally, this is just um, a sampling of some of the topics we're debating in the field right now. What would be the expected angular momentum change as a function of the tidal parameters of the Earth and Moon after the impact? Uh, I'll put in an advertisement for Raluca Rafu's poster on Thursday on this topic. How multiple impacts would affect both planetary spin and the formation retention of moons during late stage planet formation? I've emphasized that among all of the isotopic constraints, tungsten is really the most restrictive and the most difficult to understand. So we're scrutinizing this constraint in particular to see if considering different late accretion histories onto the Earth could relax it somewhat. And finally, there is an, an old problem, and that is what led to the current tilt of the moon's orbit with respect to the ecliptic. This problem is still an open one, and its ultimate solution, in particular, whether the moon's orbit was initially in the equatorial plane of the Earth or nearby, or whether the moon's orbital inclination was very large initially will bear strongly on the viability of many of these uh, origin ideas. And I'll stop there. Thank you. We have a couple minutes for questions. And while Q&A is going on, I'd like to invite folks who are uh, crowding around in the back. There are still some seats here in the, in the gallery, so please come on in. And uh, if you are standing near the door, please at least try to move away from the door. So in egress and ingress is possible. Questions for Robin? All right, they believe every word you say. Oh, here we go. All right, well, I felt like you were baiting us a little bit when you said things to do next or next needed, and I didn't see samples. Do you think we have all the samples we need? Well, actually, that's what, that's what I meant to uh, say or did I just by the it? second bullet here, which is 
of, in terms of the origin questions, any samples that are telling us about the composition of the moon at depth bring us additional key constraints. And the glasses have been uh, at the forefront of telling us about the composition at depth. We would love to get an actual sample of the lunar mantle. Uh, that may be um, accessible by looking at the big basins. That's somewhat debated. But yes, that, this is meant, uh, that second bullet is meant to indicate the samples we'd love to see. Okay, oh, there we go. Jack Schmidt, I believe, is his name. Yes, right. Uh, Are you going to tell Rob, me you're finally a believer? What's that? Are you going to tell me you're finally a believer? <laughs> no, I'm just a skeptic about everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the one thing that uh, I'm interested in hearing your explanation for are the volatile reservoirs that, that have driven the pyroclastic eruptions. So the, um, the way in which this impact generated disk would translate into an initial volatile content for the moon is one of the really active areas of research. And we heard a lot of talks on uh, this yesterday at the conference. Initially, there was an idea that if you formed this hot disk, it would be volatile poor because it was hot. Lots of works show us that's not necessarily the case because even if uh, species are vaporized, they're still strongly gravitationally bound to the Earth. So uh, there are a variety of volatile models. For example, there's the idea that uh, in the outer disk that accumulates very rapidly, you may have retained initial volatiles efficiently, and that uh, material from the hot uh, inner disk that overlaid that material initially may have been volatile poor. So some of the models suggest that there would have been a heterogeneous distribution of volatiles in the moon's interior. Um, so this is, um, I, I guess I'll close by saying that it, it's not the case that this hot disk would necessarily be volatile poor. In fact, we think most volatile species would have been retained in it. And the question is, which ones ended up in the moon and which ones ended up on the Earth? And those are some of the questions we're debating right now. And the isotopic composition of these volatile elements is a key constraint for us. Excellent. That's, I think we should move on. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. OK. Our next speaker is Steve Allardo. While he wakes his way to the podium, I will stop and reset. OK. Uh, Steve's title today is The Lunar Magma Ocean is Dead. Long live the Lunar Magma Ocean. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the conveners, uh, for this humbling and really daunting burden of trying to cover the lunar magma ocean in like 11-ish minutes. Uh, I'm going to do my best, but I want to start out today by taking you back to January 1970, about six months after the return of the Apollo samples. And two papers, one by um, Wood et al. and the other by Smith et al. from the Harvard and Chicago groups, both independently just using Apollo 11 soil samples, proposed the first lunar magma ocean models, the model in which the moon had melted to great depth and differentiated in this global melting event. Uh, this is the first schematic model from uh, the Wood et al. paper from the proceedings of the, the first iteration of this conference. Um, and I think it's interesting to just start with this picture to, to know where the starting point was. Now, if we look at where we are currently with our understanding of the lunar differentiation process, the lunar magma ocean is dead. Because our understanding of the processes of lunar differentiation reflect processes that are far, far more complex than what is depicted here. And, those, uh, and our, our, that reflects a far more complex reality of how, the, of how a planet differentiates from uh, a either partially or completely molten state relatively quickly. Now, however, if you look at this model, you still see a number of, of recognizable features. You see an anorthosite flotation crust. You see um, uh, mafic minerals settled in the deep mantle. And you see the, the mid-stage magma ocean of gabroic magma in between. So, after 50 years of scrutiny, the basic foundational principles of the magma ocean have survived that scrutiny. Long live the lunar magma ocean. They essentially got the broad strokes right. Now, if we take a look at um, a more complex view of the magma ocean, instead of trying to give you a review of that 50 years of science, I'm going to focus on four areas that I think, personally, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we've made enormous progress on in understanding the moon and understanding the magma ocean. Um, and there are also areas where I think we still have a lot more work to do. Um, now, I picked four of my favorites. Obviously, this is, um, uh, does not cover everything, so if you don't see your favorite topic, please don't yell at me at the questions. 
First topic I'm going to talk about in the next few moments is chronology, the timing of the giant impact, the timing, of, uh, timing and duration of the lunar magma ocean and its crystallization products. I'm going to touch on geodynamics and some recent work um, understanding the, uh, uh, the crystallization dynamics and uh, the, uh, the uh, dynamics of cumulate overturn. Uh, these processes are beginning to blur together, as you'll see. I'm going to touch on asymmetries, hemispheric asymmetries that, are, that we see on the moon and how they relate to the lunar differentiation process. And also touch uh, um, a bit more on volatile depletion, specifically looking at mechanisms and timing of uh, volatile loss uh, from the moon. So uh, I want to start out with chronology. So first, um, there's basically two broad types of chronologic measurements that um, I'll, I'll touch on, and I want to get everyone on the same page quickly. The first is isotopic ages of individual samples. So uh, this means things like isochron ages, this being a samarium neodymium isochron age for one rock, 76535. Uh, we also have individual ages measured from zircons. Most zircons are detrital on the moon, so we've lost some context, but we're measuring one specific age for, for, for a sample, or sometimes many ages. And these measurements are designed to determine a sample's uh, crystallization age, or um, more conservatively, its closure age, when that particular system passed its closure temperature. We're also going to talk about isotopic model ages. So uh, these, are, uh, these model ages are put together by using isotopic compositions of a single, or, uh, single sample or preferably multiple samples to define the age of an event. And this could be things like the formation of creep, the formation of Mari basalt source regions, essentially the mantle, or core formation. Uh, one example for, for core formation is tungsten. This plot from uh, Croyer and Kleine shows tungsten excesses in the, in the lunar mantle, and this helps us date core mantle equilibration. Okay, so looking a little bit more at lunar chronology, let's we'll start out with the model ages. So uh, sticking with tungsten for a moment, we see um, tungsten uh, 182 excesses in various lunar sample suites uh, that place the oldest possible differentiation age of the moon at about 4.50. And on this uh, um, plot here of, of age versus uh, sample type uh, from Amy Gaffney's review in the upcoming New Views of the, two, New View, blah, New Views of the Moon 2 volume, Sorry, uh, this little slice right up there, that represents the, uh, the maximum uh, age of the, uh, differentiation from hafnium tungsten. Uh, if we, however, look at lead-lead model ages from a number of different groups, um, lead-lead uh, model ages place the giant impact at the LMO around somewhere uh, more in the area of 4.35 to 4.37 GA. And uh, likewise, samarium neodymium and lutetium hafnium model ages for creep in the Mari basalt source also suggest a younger formation age for those particular sources. Looking at sample ages, we have uh, zircons. Uh, this is a zircon age histogram for the moon right here. We have a very prominent peak in zircons. Uh, zircon ages at about 4.35 and a small tail out to about 4.42. Um, ages uh, for uh, ferrin and orthocytes and MG suite samples, MG suite being later plutonic rocks post LMO, uh, depicted in sort of the lower portion of this diagram here. These are highly varied, but uh, if we look at uh, simply the highest fidelity ages, samples that have been dated or redated recently with the, the best analytical techniques we have, we also have a grouping around 4.35. And so what this is telling us is that Mari basalt source regions, the mantle, the crust, creep, which is the end of the LMO, and post-magma ocean um, plutonic magmatism, all either formed or re-equilibrated at about 4.35. Now there's two possible explanations for this age. Either 4.35 represents a later magmatic event. This is potentially consistent with some older uh, zircon ages and lutetium hafnium model ages. However, this event, if this is not magma ocean crystallization, this requires the crust, the mantle, creep, and MG sweet intrusive rocks to have fully re-equilibrated with a bulk moon composition at 4.35. I think that's probably difficult to do, but this is an area of active research. The other possible explanation is that this age represents magma ocean crystallization. It requires very rapid crystallization and overturn, um, and requires both the Earth and the moon to cool very, very quickly after the giant impact. And I include the Earth here, too, because we have uh, zircons from the Jack Hills Austra Australia from Valley et al.'s paper that have a, a very well-constrained uh, crystallization age of 4.37. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about recent advances in uh, geodynamics. 
uh, both related to the LMO and overturn. So lunar magma ocean crystallization, we're learning, is, is primarily controlled in broad strokes by the interplay of viscosity and crystallization rate. Um, some recent work by Nick Diger et al. showed that um, uh, very low viscosity, late stage, iron rich magma ocean liquids um, uh, would tell us that we have very, very efficient uh, plagioclase segregation into the lunar, uh, the lunar crust. However, in some sense, this is uh, potentially inconsistent with grail crustal thickness. Um, a paper by Charlier et al. Uh, that recently experimentally constrained the magma ocean crystallization sequence essentially showed, and this, this is a plot of crustal thickness versus magma ocean depth uh, for two amounts of trapped interstitial liquid. Basically, um, if we have a deep magma ocean and a 100% flotation efficiency of plage, we make a crust that's far too thick. So this is sort of inconsistent, and it may suggest that um, uh, the uh, segregation of plage to the crust may not have been as, as efficient as we, as we think. Switching gears a little bit to talk about overturn. Um, 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 work by a number of groups has shown that um, late stage LMO cumulants, the high, the high titanium cumulants, are very weak um, relative to early LMO cumulants. Um, and some work from the Brown group has shown that under certain thermal regimes um, and viscosity structures in the cumulate pile, cumulant overturn can actually begin before the end of magma ocean solidification. We heard a little bit about this in the lunar session yesterday. This is a plot simply showing time of magma ocean crystallization versus magma viscosity. And these uh, uh, lines in this parameter space here for, for different planets show the, the regimes in which uh, we have early convection of the cumulate pile versus sort of the traditional late overturn um, model. And so the timing of, uh, of crystallization affects compaction in the mantle. That affects viscosity and the amount of trap melt in the mantle. And this can affect, the t uh, in turn, the timing of mantle overturn and how well we preserve heterogeneity in the lunar mantle. Now, we've known about he the hemispheric asymmetries on the moon um, basically since the first time we sent a spacecraft around the far side. Um, this is just sort of a, a picture of the moon, albedo map. Um, and you can see that the near side is dominated. Um, uh, most of Mare volcanism is dominated on the near side. We have very little on the far side. This shouldn't be news to anybody who's been in this, this conference at all in the last, uh, last you know, 30 years. Um, we also have chemistry differences. We have the prosolarium creep terrain on the far side. This is a thorium map. Thorium, uh, creep is uh, rich in thorium. We see creep concentrated on the near side. And we also see heter uh, uh, hemispheric asymmetries in crustal thickness with the, the uh, th uh, thickness of the crust on the far side being um, substantially thicker than on the near side. Um, now, uh, reflectance spectra collected by a number of uh, recent orbital spacecraft have shown also that we have um, uh, an MG number asymmetry between the near side and the far side. So this is a histogram of MG number of um, locations on the far side of the moon versus the near side. And there's a full 10 point MG number difference on the far side with the, the far side having a higher MG number than the near side. And we're looking at the highlands terrain here. So this could be um, uh, uh, evidence for asymmetric magma ocean crystallization. A couple of these models such as tilted convection have been proposed in the past. And this also had, uh, presents a way for um, creep uh, and potentially the heat for Mari basalt production to be concentrated on the near side. The last uh, uh, topic I'll touch on is volatile depletion. So we've known since Apollo that lunar samples are depleted in highly and moderately volatile elements relative to Earth. Uh, this is shown here um, on a double normalized uh, uh, plot of volatile uh, composition versus condensation temperature. This is the Earth trend here in blue. This is the more depleted lunar trend. Mechanisms of volatile depletion are still being heavily debated in the community. And uh, we have both pre and syn magma ocean depletion models. And it might not be either one. It could be both at the same time. But looking quick, quickly at pre magma ocean depletion models, so high temperature volatile loss during the giant impact has long been proposed as a de uh, volatile depletion mechanism for the moon. But more recently, we have isotopic compositions of um, stable isotopic compositions of things like zinc and potassium, gallium, and sulfur that show that uh, the bulk silicate moon is potentially fractionated relative to the bulk silicate Earth. This is a plot of potassium isotopic compositions uh, from uh, Wang and Jakobsen. And you see that the moon is offset relative to Earth and chondrites. And so one uh, potential explanation that uh, Robin touched on was incomplete uh, accretion of volatile rich materials to the moon. Um, now if we talk about, uh, at my sort of last uh, uh, 
info slide here, volatile depletion during the magma ocean. We also have heavy uh, chlorine isotopic compositions that seem to correlate with creep. Um, and suggest, this also suggests that the mantle is unfractionated. Uh, models have been proposed for degassing of creep, um, either from the magma ocean itself or from uh, uh, a potential PKT impact basin. And we have recent work um, suggesting that stable uh, isotopic variations in chromium and variations in zinc also point towards magma ocean degassing. This is sort of a schematic model of that from uh, Jess Barnes' paper from a couple of years ago. And finally, we have um, work from Miki Nakajima and Dave Stevenson suggesting that we may not actually lose as much hydrogen as we think from the proto-lunar disk. So what I want to end, I don't have any conclusions. Um, there's obviously a lot more work to do, but I wanted to end with this Apollo 11 soil sample. This is 10085, and this is the subsample that Wood et al. used um, in six months to basically come up with the magma ocean model for the moon. So I wanted to put that up there and, and um, remind everybody that although Neil and Buzz's you know, first steps may have been small, um, getting samples from planetary bodies and understanding samples is how planetary science takes giant leaps. So thank you very much. I'm afraid we're right at 9 o'clock on the dot, so Steve, you are uh, off the hook for answering any questions. We'll have to move on. Awesome. Our next paper is by Harry Hesinger, and his title this morning is The Lunar Apollo Missions, Enabling Dating of Planetary Surfaces Throughout the Solar System. Good morning, everybody. So it's really an honor and pleasure to talk to you about how the Apollo missions enabled us to date planetary surfaces. You see only my name on this first slide. In fact, this is completely wrong. So this is, of course, the work of many, many people. So if I didn't list your name, I apologize. But this is really a long tradition to do crater counts and, and date the lunar surface. So let's start early or simple. You know, uh, how do we do dating of planetary surfaces? Well, you can, of course, apply different techniques on lab cross-cutting relationships, all these things that give you relative ages. But the point that I would like to make here is that crater size frequency distribution measurements are really an excellent tool to date these surfaces. So the fundamental postulate behind this method is that with time, a surface will accumulate more and more impact craters. So the number of superposed impact crater is directly related to the geologic time that the surface has been explained, uh, exp uh, exposed to the, to the meteorite bombardment. And this technique has obviously been uh, put forward by some of the giants in our field, like Erpik and Shoemaker and, and Hortman and Chapman and so forth. So this is has a long tradition and uh, is really an excellent technique. Now, going away from relative ages, we want to be more quantitative, so we try to do some measurements, crater size frequency distribution measurements. How do we do this? Well, first of all, you have to map a homogeneous area. In the old days, this was based mostly on albedo, but nowadays, with the really excellent data that we have from LRO and other missions, we use topography, we use slope maps, we use color information just to define a homogeneous area so that we can, in the end, interpret our ages in a meaningful way. Then we do our crater counts within this area, and we can plot these crater counts in different ways. Usually you have the diameter down here and then either cumulative or differential or whatever you want, you know, plot it there. We fit our data with the so-called standard distribution or the production function. We pick a, a, a reference diameter, which is usually one or 10 kilometers. And this gives you then the number of cumulative craters uh, for one kilometer and larger. And if you have a plot that's lying up here, you know, you would get an older age and you would get a higher number, uh, N of one number. So this gives you a relative age. But again, this is not really sort of what we want. We want to have absolute ages and that's where the Apollo missions really came in because with this cumulative crater frequency that you just determined, you can now go into this chronology curve which links basically the retimetric and exposure ages of the samples that were brought back by the astronauts with this cumulative crater frequency. And you can then basically put a curve, an empirical curve through your data points. And when you have measured your uh, frequency, you go over there, you get down here, and you have your age. So this gives you the absolute age. Now you can imagine uh, that this would be an ideal case where you just have one chronology in reality. 
uh, it is a little different. So here's the horrible truth about chronology. Okay. Uh, many chronologies have been proposed. Um, the latest one by Stu Roberts, uh, Stuart Robbins, you know, this uh, yellow one, uh, the canonical Neukomm curve is shown here in this reddish color. Um, I prefer the, the, the Neukomm one. It's the least uh, extreme one, if you will. But this is really actually sort of an active research, you know, which chronology is actually the correct one. We don't know for sure, okay? And this is really of uttermost importance because we take this curve and extrapolate it to all the other planets. So if you see an age of lava flows on Mars, it's based on this curve, okay? So we have to all work hard on this to get this curve right. And so that's what we're trying to do. So whatever, uh, chronology you prefer, all of them, as you see, suffer from certain uh, deficits, and this is basically this huge gap in between one and three billion years, roughly speaking, where we do not have any sample that we could correlate with crater counts, okay? So in this part of the curve, uh, the curve is actually unconstrained as it is for ages that are older than, let's say, about three or uh, 3.9 or 4 billion years. So we desperately need either new samples from this part or this part, okay, or at least some in situ measurements to date the surfaces uh, right there, okay. Um, we can still sort of investigate whether these uh, data points that we use for our chronology are correct, and that's what we do right now. So we went through all the landing sites and did some detailed geologic mapping, uh, even at better scale than what I show here. We go into the landing sites and look where the samples have been picked from uh, so that we can correlate the samples with our crater counts. We reinvestigate all the sample ages that have been published. So this is a tremendous amount of work and I would like to actually invite the sample community to help us with picking the, the correct ages. So let's just move on to some applications. So what can we learn about the moon applying this technique? Well, here I'm showing um, a plot that shows all the uh, Mari basalt ages. This plot has been, or this map has been put together over the last 25 years. And what you can take away from this is that, first of all, we have a very large range of ages uh, spanning about three billion years. The ages are not homogeneously distributed. You see older ages in the eastern part of the, of the moon, and you see younger ages sort of associated with the Procellarum creep terrain. You also see very young ages of about 1.2 billion years. So those ages were heavily criticized when I published this map. Nowadays that we have better geophysical models taking into account the, uh, the, insulation, pro uh, the insulation properties of the mega regolith, you can actually produce these uh, young ages very nicely. You know, you can keep the moon warm enough for, for long enough. So it also means that volcanisms ceased basically in the eastern, ceased earlier in the eastern hemisphere compared to the western hemisphere where you had this additional uh, amount of heat producing elements there. Uh, we also looked at uh, the far side now uh, and what we found was that the far side and the near side have very similar behavior. So we see the most uh, volcanic activity at about 3.6 billion years and then this decline into the Eratosthenian system and maybe some episodic eruptions later on at about 2 billion years. But the general uh, behavior is the same. Uh, we can also use the data now to look into the chemical, mineralogical uh, properties of these units. Uh, this is work by Seto et al. 2017 that shows basically the age uh, compared to the thorium concentration and also the titanium concentration. In the old models, people proposed that there's a trend in, in, in mineralo mineralogy and composition with age, but we don't see this really uh, in, in our data. But the important point here is the data can now be used to give us a wider picture, a broader picture. They expand the knowledge that we get from the, from the samples. So where it really gets tricky is very young, Volcanism, uh, Braden et al. had a paper in 2014 looking at the, uh, the imp deposits and they came up with really, really young ages. So, and I'm concerned that uh, you know, keeping the, womb, the moon warm enough to produce eruptions that late in lunar history is really tricky. So therefore there has been an alternative interpretation where 
uh, Chow and had proposed that we have some foam eruptions and the target properties of this foam would basically influence our crater statistics. So this is a, an interesting idea that still needs to be further explored, I would say. Now, let me come on to the, the light plains. So um, light plains, as you know, have been interpreted as some special type of highland volcanism before Apollo 16, but after Apollo 16, uh, people argued that they were probably formed by the two youngest and large basins, Imbrium and Orient Orientale. So if this is the case, then we would expect uh, an age distribution that is sort of reflecting the ages of Imbrium or Orientale. Uh, we dated many of those uh, light planes now, and what we see is that we, in fact, see a, a wide range of ages um, that is, in my opinion, less consistent with a single impact event. And we also see many light planes that are younger than the youngest impact basin. So in my interpretation, this rather argues for a, a formation of the light planes by multiple impacts, not just the large impact basins uh, or entirely in Imbrium. In 2017, you and others uh, produced a, a, a map where they derived ages for wrinkle ridge systems in the near side Mori area. And later on in 2018, there have been several papers now published on very small scarps. And as you can see, these small scarps, I just marked them here as dots because they're really tiny. They are fairly young, so uh, less than a couple of hundred million years old, uh, implying, and Tom Waters and, and Maria Banks and others interpreted this, that there's a that the moon was basically shrinking in the last billion year, uh, but there's also, of course, some, some tidal deformation uh, effect on, in addition to that. So this is the map that I put together. This is sort of the status quo uh, of all the ages that I could find. Uh, you can see there are still lots of gray areas, so I'm up for retirement in 2031, so <laughs> I still have plenty of work to do. So uh, one other topic that I would touch on quickly because uh, Barbara Cohen will, will do much much better job and much more give you much more details is the question on the cataclysm. So the way how we try to contribute to this discussion is we dated uh, South Polaken ba Basin <laughs> uh, and came up with a, an age of about 4.3 billion years. So South Polaken is presumably the, the oldest basin, so it in a sense opens the window for all impacts that followed, and the Orientale would then basically close this window. So the further you can push back the SPA event, uh, the wider your window gets, and the less likely the cataclysm uh, gets. So as I said, we have an age that is fairly old, so in, in my opinion, this cataclysm uh, does not exist. It's probably just an artifact of the Apollo samples, actually. And if you look at uh, meteorite collections that have been investigated by Barbara and Greg Michael, um, you don't really see a peak at uh, 3.9 to 4 billion years, which was the, the classical cataclysm peak. So applying this method to other bodies, that where it gets really tricky. So you can easily, I guess, inter, inter, or extrapolate the, the method to uh, the inner solar system, Mars, Mercury, and so forth. But when you get out into the asteroid belt and into the outer solar system, then the discrepancies uh, become fairly large. So I'm showing you here the chronology, for example, for Sirius in, in orange and in, in blue. The blue line is basically the extrapolation from what we know of the moon towards Sirius, and the orange line is is based on, on uh, the size frequency distribution of the, the asteroid belt. And as you can see, you know, the differences are extremely large. And this is definitely something that we all need to work on so that we can extrapolate confidently this method to the outer solar system. So this brings me to the conclusions. The most important thing I would like to mention here is, or would like to do is to thank the astronauts because Jack is sitting right in his second row here. So thank you very, very much for risking your life and going to the moon and bringing back these samples that we can all benefit even 50 years after you went there, okay? So uh, the impact chronology, as I mentioned, is really just derivable from the on the moon because we have these samples and we can do the crater counts. And then there are a couple of things that relate to the CST measurements. So 
it's by far a more complicated story than just simply counting craters, but we can date unsampled, unsampled surfaces on the moon and the inner solar system. They provide us a global view compared to the site-specific information, and they allow us to understand the geology, the mineralogy, and the thermal evolution of the moon. And really important, they also help us identify regions where we should go, pick up new samples, or do in situ uh, age dating. Thank you very much. Probably have time for about one question. If anyone likes to jump to the microphone, please identify yourself and your institution. Uh, Mark Robinson, Arizona State University. I, you did a really good job of pointing out the weaknesses of you know, the whole AMAs on the plot, the greater size frequency distributions, but I'd like to point out one weakness that we haven't really come to grips with yet, and that's the um, contamination of the crater size frequency di distribution on young, especially smaller craters of self-secondaries. And so we, we, we sort of have this complete confidence in North Ray and you know, the other small craters where we have these good age dates on them. And you can count the craters now with you know, down to one meter scale, but a significant number of those craters shouldn't be in the crater size frequency distribution, or the model needs to be changed to accept the fact that a large percentage of those craters on the youngest craters are self-secondaries. Well, this is, <laughs> this brings me to this point back, you know, caveats, okay. So <laughs> I didn't really talk about this yet, but it's, it's clear it's not a perfect method, and that's ongoing research, you know. You know, with LRO, we, we have now data that go down to half a meter. That's, uh, so we are opening a, a totally new can of worms going down to create accounts that small because then we have target property effects and also see some, some self-secondary cratering and, and so forth, you know. Um, that, that's certainly true. But nevertheless, the method does a very nice job in reproducing the ages uh, that were derived from the sample. So uh, there is certainly some fine tweaking necessary, but the overall concept no matter what chronology you use, I think is sound. Okay, thanks, Harry. Let's go ahead and move on. Uh, just re remind folks, if you could, I know it's uh, pretty crowded in back. There still are some choice seats hipper up front, and we really do need to keep the doorway clear, please. So do your best to uh, move away from the door. Thank you. Our next speaker this morning is Barbara Cohen, and her title is A Glint of Light on Broken Glass, Solar System Bombardment from Apollo Samples. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Um, here's my haiku for uh, this LPSC. And um, if you come tomorrow to the ceremony, you can see that it was a winner. So thanks for having me to the session. Um, like Harry, I owe a great debt to literally thousands of people um, who I may or may not be able to mention. So please don't take it personally. Um, not only the astronauts and the PIs of all the work, but also the curators and the curation staff um, all the students and postdocs who have done this work. So one of the more important um, legacies of the Apollo missions and the Apollo sample returns, of course, is establishing this absolute planetary time scale, not just for the moon, crater counting for the moon um, tied to radiometric ages, but then taking this crater curve and applying it throughout the entire solar system. This is the basis for which we understand the age of the highlands of Mercury, the ages of the basins on Mars, a lot of planetary processes that take place throughout the solar system. And one of our enduring goals is to be able to place the planets and the planetary processes relative to one another to understand the evolution of the entire solar system. And that gets into dynamical models of populations, how populations change, how planets evolve, um, how, they, uh, how evolution of orbits evolve. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about that today, um, but it's an extremely important topic. And I'll refer you to numerous reviews, including one that's going to come out in New Views of the Moon, too, um, on this topic. But in my abstract, there's probably a half a dozen more. So if you really want all of the quantitative details and all of the references, um, please see all of these reviews. They're all very good. But of course, here's the uh, cumulative number of craters. This is crater counting, which Harry just walked you through. 
um, versus absolute age. Um, and when we have these key benchmark craters like Copernicus Tycho Cone Crater, um, we have the Mare surfaces here that are well dated. We have expanses that we can count craters on. We brought the samples back and get their ages. And we have basins up here. So here we talked a lot about these. I will touch on them briefly. Um, and then we're going to really talk about what's going on up here. If you fit a curve through uh, these data, that's a constant production rate throughout time that fits our current understanding of cratering on the Earth and Moon because we are one system. That dashed line takes you through these nice young craters and through the nice Mare surfaces, but comes out over here. And it doesn't take into account these big basins. So that is one of the more important questions, I think, that came out of the Apollo sample dating and one we'll spend a lot of time on today. So just to go back to what our expectations were before we had the Apollo samples, um, some of our patron saints of our field up here, even if you don't think you're a lunar scientist, you probably owe much of your career to one of these people. Um, they were all very active in developing uh, impact cratering as a planetary process, in particular for the moon. And this is a G.K. Gilbert map of the moon, where here's Mare Imbrium. It's upside down because, you know, telescopes. So here's Mare Imbrium, and here's the sculptured terrain that he mapped. This is the pervasive influence of Imbrium. We'll come back to this. Um, and here you see some other giants are field, Bill Harmon and Gene Shoemaker, uh, preparing for exploring the moon. This was a pretty well-established idea, uh, at least in the planetary, the nascent planetary community, even if it wasn't well accepted in the broader geology community. Um, but we had some expectations that the lunar surface would be ancient. We didn't know how old that the large circular mare fill in ancient basins. So we figured out that those are pretty big ancient basins. And there's a stratigraphic relationship there between the filling mare and the big basins. Um, and that impact craters can be sampled using their ejecta. So these are really important guiding principles for choosing Apollo sampling sites. So here's the, uh, the title of the talk. Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me a glint of light on broken glass. So don't tell me that the moon is old. Show me how old it is. Give me that sample. Put it in my hand. There it is. There's 10003. That's one of the uh, first basalts that was cataloged, of course, and one of the first to be dated. And there's the, there's the glint of light shining through that broken glass. It's a beautiful basalt. And uh, that was one of the first to be dated, like I said. And it comes out at 3.74, 3.8 billion years. So that tells us how old the moon is, how ancient that surface is, much more ancient than anything we'd ever found on the Earth. So that tells us that there's multiple basalt flows. They're very ancient. The basins must be older than that because of their stratigraphic relationship. And that tells us that the early solar system history is recorded on the moon. We got all of that from one single sample, in fact, the first big sample we returned from the moon. So thank you to Apollo 11 for returning those. So after that, one of the uh, guiding principles for looking uh, at new landing sites was to understand the relationships of those big basins and to understand the ages of those basins. So I'm showing you a plot. This is from Don Bogard's uh, paper, review paper in 1995. So it's about halfway through the 50-year period. So about 25 years after the Apollo samples were returned, about 25 years before present, sort of a snapshot in time of what we had learned. These are 4039 argon ages. Um, so these are impact ages only. These are crystallization from a melt or some kind of gas loss and disturbance, mostly crystallization. Um, and it's just a, a nice illustration to show you uh, some of the other basins that we really tried to target with the Apollo missions. In particular, Apollo 14 was selected to date Imbrium. It's right on the edge of Imbrium in that ejecta blanket. Um, here's the histogram of impact melt ages, um, and Don uh, pulled 3.85 out as the best age for Imbrium. This is uh, a little bit younger than the uranium lead ages that we're getting now for phosphates, um, but is, you know, it's pretty old is the main point here. Um, Apollo 16 um, selected to date the Cayley Plains, um, but also we figured out there were probably Nectaris impact melts in there. Nectaris is a nearby basin. It's older stratigraphically than Imbrium. And so people were really looking for and continue to look for impact melt samples from Nectaris in that pile of Apollo 16 samples, which we'll discuss. We've had varying success with that. But if you look at maybe the oldest set of samples in the Apollo 16 regolith, the oldest set of impact melts, it's about 4.1 billion years. Maybe that's the age of Nectaris. 
Apollo 17, of course, was selected to date Serenitatis. Um, and you can see the histogram skews a lot older in their impact melt ages. Um, and again, uh, Dalmer Bone Rider pulled out this 3.9 uh, billion year age. And this is again in potassium argon, or argon argon, and lead lead ages tend to be um, older than this. Um, in addition to the Apollo uh, missions, Luna 20 um, landed uh, in a highlands area near the Christian Basin, and some people think, um, based on those um, in Apollo 17 samples, that maybe we have Christian samples at about 3.89. And stratigraphically, of course, Oriental is younger than Imbrium, and so uh, 3.85, but a little bit younger than 3.85. So if you're just looking at this evidence for basins, you can quibble about where exactly these are, but it's five basins all within this very short period of time. And that gave rise to this idea of the cataclysm. The cast classic cataclysm is that there was a widespread event on the moon with multiple basins being formed. If you think five big basins were being formed, then sort of the tail of impactors that had to come in with it would have resurfaced large portions of the moon, um, opened up a lot of isotopic systems, reset or disturbed a lot of isotopic systems, caused widespread metamorphism. And this is about 500 million years after the formation of the moon, although now with the magma ocean being pushed younger and younger, it may not be so young. But at the time, this was a pretty radical idea because we didn't have any way to explain this population of bodies. So samples are the gifts that keep on giving, obviously. Um, now, I, this is my compilation uh, from, again, probably hundreds of sources. Thank you all for doing this work. Um, these are all 4039 ages um, as well. And so here's 4.5 billion years, and here's zero. Here's just the number of samples. This doesn't take into account um, their uncertainties. It doesn't take into account multiple dating of similar samples. Um, so it's just illustrative to show you some of the main points. And this is as we continue to look at Apollo samples, like Apollo 16 samples, um, spherules and glasses, lunar meteorites. Um, this is sort of the buildup that we get. And the salient features are this classic cataclysm. Um, this is a pileup of ages around four billion years old, impact affected ages. There's lots of ages that are older than this, but they are igneous crystallization ages. We don't have anything still that is un indubitably impact created. Um, sorry, not anything. We have very few examples. There are definitely examples, but there are few of them, and they certainly don't build up a picture of declining bombardment that would have many, 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 many impact affected samples older than four billion years. Um, we have uh, this middle age here, um, which just has a low impact flux. It's good for preserving Mari basalt ages. Um, and as you heard Harry say, there's still some uncertainty there. We have this young tail here. Um, there is some suggestion of an upturn in recent flux, and that's been borne out by glass samples, um, spherules, and some modeling, um, and looking at degradation of young lunar craters that just came out this year. So what samples giveth, they can taketh away. <laughs> As we look more and more at these, what we thought were serenitatis and peck melts at Apollo 17 actually have strong affinities to Imbrium. Um, so they're probably not serenitatis. Um, there's still a lot of debate around that. Apollo 16 impact melts have this wide range. Like I said, we don't know definitively what's Nectaris and what's not. Apollo 17 and Luna 20 Chrysium rocks will have a wide range as well. So we don't know which one is Chrysium. And when we look more at crater counting and we see a couple different stratigraphies that have come out, Serenitatis goes all over the place. And again, this 4.3 age comes out in lunar zircons, lunar phosphates, now in magma ocean. Uh, so what is going on at 4.3? We still don't know. So the main point here is samples that thrown, are thrown from basins don't come tagged with their origin. And again, here's G.K. Gilbert's map. This is the pervasive influence of Imbrium. You can see this Imbrium sculpture going all the way out past all of our Apollo samples. So uh, maybe G.K. Gilbert had something going on there. So what should we do to continue the legacy of Apollo? We should develop and explore new methods and criteria for dating impact products. Um, we don't have very much going on up here anymore, but I'll remind you that even though this was developed based on lunar samples, since then we've looked at a lot of asteroidal samples and other kinds of planetary materials, and we do see hints of this cataclysm or this increased period of bombardment that's driven out a lot of dynamical models. So even if this doesn't turn out to be correct, we have learned so much about our solar system and early solar system history. 
We want more samples. That's like an obligatory point to put up here. Um, and I think that a diversity of approaches and a diversity in our community will really help build out this framework for the solar system. Thank you. We've got a couple minutes for questions for Barbara. Barbara, I've got one real quick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was going to ask Harry this, but we kind of ran out of time. Uh, on this uh, lovely, this is uh, taken from Fred Hertz's 1992 uh, uh, paper. It is. Uh, how well known are some of those youngest points we have on this curve? I know you focus mostly on the older side, but what, what exactly was dated uh, to get the ages uh, estimates for things like Copernicus and Tycho? So th we think that those are impact melts to the best of our ability to understand what it, an impact melt rock is and tie it back to that crater. So the actual ages are pretty good. Um, but it, it's very dependent on what you think the material is. It would just be so much better to go to that crater and get a melt sheet. Um, and we haven't been able to do that. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Robinson, ASU. Um, since uh, Spudis isn't with us here today, I'll stand up and be cranky for Please him. Please do. <laughs> about the fact that the... Um, Overlapping morphological relationships between Chrysium and Serenitatis point to Serenitatis being significantly older than Chrysium. Mm -hmm. And the large crater population superposed on the Serenitatis ejecta puts it way older than Nectaris. So it does not match by any stretch of the imagination the um, radiometric age date. So there might be a mismatch between the samples and their origin, or the cataclysm might be more cataclysmic than we even thought, that there may have been 25 basins or 50 basins formed within a uh, you know, 1,500 million year. Period. Sure, so yeah, this is this point, crater counting results. Um, some of the stratigraphy puts it older and some puts it younger, and it's an excellent point um, based on crater counting and what exactly you're counting. Um, like I said, we don't really know whether we have Serenitatis impact melt or not. Um, but I think your point about maybe we're getting an even more cataclysm is interesting. If the, you know, Steve's talk said, well, maybe the lunar magma ocean didn't really solidify until 4.3. Um, if that's true and we don't have a crust that can support these basins until then, then all of the basins that we see have to have formed in that strong crust that is getting pushed later and later in history. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, the co-authors on our next talk are Juliana Gross and Tab Preisel. Uh, the talk will be given by Juliana, and their title this morning is The Best Part of the Pie, The Crust, Old and New Views of the Moon from Apollo and Beyond. Thank you, Dave. And uh, I really would like to thank the conveners for inviting me to this fantastic session. And I would like to uh, thank all the explorers and amazing scientists that have come before me and all the scientists that are really amazing that will come after me. So I would like to start with uh, some images of the moon. And ever we have glanced into the night sky, we have been fascinated by and curious about the moon. And here you can see a map from Galileo in 1610, um, a sketch where you can start to see the mare basalts here. We have a map and a sketch from Cassini in 1680 that is remarkably detailed uh, of the surface. And of course, this is the moon as we know it today and love it uh, from some of the amazing images that NASA has produced. The lunar crust really is a museum of planetary science because the moon hasn't changed much since its formation and therefore it preserves the record of the Earth-Moon formation and its evolution and we have direct evidence from samples and these could be uh, endogenic and exogenic materials uh, we have indirect evidence, such as hydrothetophile elements, that will tell us something about core formation, accretion, mantle melting, and even degassing. And we can also call the lunar crust a space probe and a time machine, because the surface has been interacting with the solar wind and the cosmic galactic X-rays over billions of years. Um, and so it records the solar system climate, the environment that the Earth-Moon system has been exposed to since their formation. And therefore, the lunar crust is really an archive, and we need to learn how to read the archive, how to interpret, and how to translate it correctly. And hopefully, in the future, the lunar crust will be a place that we will return back to and maybe get more samples. The Apollo 
uh, missions collected 382 kilograms of rocks and all the return samples are either uh, samples directly from the primary crust, like the Apollo 16 and Northside sample here, or there are modifications made to the crust through impact processes, and we've heard from Harry and Barb Cohen uh, this morning about this. And then these impacts create these beautiful brecciated samples. This is an Apollo 16 breccia. Or the samples are additions to the crust, and these could be through um, endogenous processes like volcanism that then creates mare basalts, like this really beautiful Apollo 11 basalt here. These could also be through exogenic processes, like stuff that brought, was brought to the sample into the crust later on in addition. So from these samples, we have learned that the moon indeed is an igneous differentiated body, um, and it opened the access to another set of planetary materials, and we knew exactly where they came from. And we can see the beautiful uh, image here that our beloved Paul Spudis created where the moon has the layers with the core, mantle, and the crust. And specifically the crust we have learned formed by crystallization and flotation from plagioclase uh, in a global magma ocean, and we've heard about this through, our, through the entire conference so far and this morning from Steve Allardo. Now this specific model of formation has become the cornerstone for crust formation throughout the entire solar system. That means that lunar science, basically all of it, uh, is tied to and anchored by lunar samples. And here's just an example from an Apollo 16 breccia. We need these samples. These samples are really important because we use them for calibration and ground truthing of our remote sensing instruments so that we can see the global distribution of rocks on the surface. We need them to absolute age date them. And you just heard from Barb Cohen and Harry Hesinger why this is important so that we can then learn about the impact history of the moon and calibrate our crater counting, which not only dates the surface of the moon, but we can extrapolate this and date all the other planetary surfaces throughout the solar system. The porosity and the density of these samples will help us interpret global mission data sets like the gravity map here from GRAIL. Geochemistry, mineralogy, petrology tells us everything about the moon from accretion, core formation, all the way through crustal evolution. And magnetic properties will also, of these samples will also tell us something about the inside and uh, state of the core. But Apollo samples are also really important in a different aspect because they helped us recognize a different type of rock, meteorites. And this is the first meteorite that was uh, recognized as coming from the moon. This is Allen Hills 81005. And it was found in Antarctica in the field season uh, 81, 82. And this is a yay shout out to Ensmet and the amazing people who go to Antarctica to collect these rocks for us to study. And meteorites are really important because when we look at the thorium map, and we've seen this a couple times already throughout the session, you can see that the return samples really special. They come from this region. This is geologically very interesting, but compared to the rest of the moon, it's not representative. So this is the uh, Procalarium creep terrain here, which is enriched in creepy materials, and that stands for potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphor. The rest of the moon isn't creepy, so the Apollo samples are not really representative for all of the, the lunar surface. And that's where the meteorites come in, because we can expand our view of crustal evolution through these particular rocks. So meteorites can contain uh, rock fragments and lithologies that are distinct from the lithologies and rock types we have in the Apollo collections. Um, here's an example of a Danitic clast that Alan Treeman and Julia Zemprick found this year. It's a Danitic clast right here. This is a red, green, and blue map. Um, and you can see in red the magnesium. It's over 95% in olivine. And so we think that the lunar mantle is magnesium, but through remote sensing, the lunar mantle is kind of like it's very elusive. It's sort of hiding from us, and we haven't quite figured out where it is. So any new xenolithic mantle material that we could find and have our hands on and actually analyze will help us gain insights into the interior layers of the moon and the formation. So by looking at crustal rocks, we're not only limited to learning about the crust, we will also learn things um, of the interior of the moon because it preserves 
deeper material that was brought through the first surface through impacts. And so if you are more interested in this particular topic of the xenolithic mantle material here, I would encourage you to go see the Treeman and Semprick talk on Thursday afternoon. Another rock type that we didn't even know existed are these pink spinel rich lithologies. These were discovered simultaneously in samples. This is a piece of the pink spinel rich lithology uh, in Allen Hills 81L5. And remote sensing, here is the M cube spectra of this pink, pink spinel lithology with the two micron absorption feature. This is for reference a terrestrial spinel. And these rocks are different from the spinel bearing uh, Apollo samples that we have because these rocks contain 30% or more of this pink spinel. Why is this important? Well, we think that these rocks form through melt wall rock interaction, while we have picritic melt or magnesium sweet melt that intrudes into the crust and then reacts with the crust and forms these pink spinels around the boundary. And this is a prime example of how sample science drives remote sensing and how remote sensing drives sample science and this beautiful feedback and positive conversation that we're having. Because magnesium sweet rocks in the Apollo samples are always associated with creep. And so we think that a creep is necessary um, to produce heat producing elements to melt and produce magnesium sweet magmatism. But when we now take a look at the remote sensing observations of where we find these pink spinels, you can see that they're basically globally distributed. And if pink spinel really is associated with Mg sweet magmatism, that would indicate that Mg sweet magmatism also is a global occurrence and that creep maybe is not the driver, but just a passenger of Mg sweet magmatism. And this is a really exciting topic. This is a, one of these unanswered questions that we haven't been able to answer yet. And if you are interested in learning more about Mg sweet magmatism and how that influences the crystallization trends of lunar lithologies, I would encourage you to go to Tab Preisel's talk on Thursday morning and you will be satisfied to learn more about that. <laughs> Meteorites not only give us information about uh, Mg sweet magmatism, we will also learn more about basaltic uh, and mare basalt volcanism. So we have three Northwest Africa meteorites now, they're all unpaired, that record the youngest volcanism that we have to date in samples. They are all around 2.9 billion years. And this really highlights the significance that there is more geochemical variation on the moon than is represented in the Apollo sample collection. So meteorites are really important, but the Apollo samples continue to be really important as well. And we continue to see new information that is being revealed by looking at Apollo samples really carefully. Um, this, these are exogenic fragments that have been found in the Apollo samples. And so they're not only giving us information about the moon itself and the lunar formation, but we're also getting formation, information about what the material that was delivered to the Earth-Moon system uh, and had an, an effect on the Earth-Moon system. And if you haven't seen the poster yesterday about the survival of terrestrial material uh, on the lunar surface, I would encourage you to read that abstract. There is a new a uh, fragment that potentially comes from the Archean Earth that was reported earlier this year by Bellucci. So the point here is that the crust not only preserves processes that are related to the moon, it also preserves the history of our entire solar system. And these are not the first uh, exogenic fragments that have been found on the moon, and they will very clearly not be the last fragments that, that we will find. And with new and higher precision techniques, we will continue to um, reveal new information within these Apollo samples. There is a new technique uh, by Mercer et al. This is an in situ dating technique. And now we can start to look at age distributions within single grains. We can learn more about the shock history of the lunar crust uh, within single grains by using Raman and cathodoluminescence. And this has been done by Pernay Fisher and Jarrett. Um, where we can see crystalline parts and, and shocked parts. And this is really important so that we can learn more about uh, the Im impact history that affected the moon. We also continue to get new insights into the volatile cycle of the moon, which is important, and, and Robin has um, touched on that earlier today. And with magnetism and more updated techniques, we even learn more about the state of the core and the lunar dynamo. So in conclusion, you can see that the crust is really important and that samples and the crust tie together all of the lunar fields. But 
that also the lunar fields tie back into the samples and inform each other. So this is this beautiful conversation. And I think in the next decades to come, we really need to focus on having these stronger conversations with, between these fields so that we end up with this beautiful circle um, and with the renewed interest in older samples that we already have in the collection and with new samples that we might find for meteorites and maybe even return samples and this dialogue between the fields, who knows what else we're going to find? Who knows what other lithologies we discover that we didn't know existed or processes that we can start to unravel and understand better? So just like the pie crust ties together and holds together a pie, the lunar crust really holds together <laughs> the moon. And therefore, it's the best part. And with that, um, happy birthday to Apollo 11 and happy birthday to LPSC. And I'm, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Will you have a couple minutes uh, for questions? Anyone interested in the crust? It's the best part. I have to say, I really like the crust of the pie. When right? I have a piece of pie, I love yep. the crust. It's flaky, delicious. You know, Harry mentioned South Pole Aitken bacon, and now I'm thinking about pie. I <laughs> didn't have any breakfast this morning. All right, we actually are up to like a minute ahead of schedule here. So we'll, oh, oh Dr. Great. Schmidt. I'll ask one, Dave. Uh, the crust, uh, would you like to comment on the extreme th thickness of the crust that's mm -hmm. between uh, uh, the Procolarum Basin and the uh, Orientale Basin? Yeah. Um, so we don't really know yet. This is one of the, the unanswered and exciting topics that we're still trying to figure out why there is this crustal dichotomy. Um, and I'm hoping that either uh, Maria or Renee or Carly is gonna, gonna talk about that. That's why I didn't have this in this talk. But yes, there's this crustal dichotomy where we have the thinner near side crust and the thicker far side crust. And uh, Steve you know, mentioned this a little bit of like why there is this dichotomy and maybe it has something to do with the magma ocean crystallization or even creep and melting or the impacts that stripped away some of the crust and then deposited it on the, on the far side. So Well, that's where I was trying to get to is uh, the uh, potential of a Procolarum impact mm -hmm. and coincidence with a uh, not, co uh, not coincident impact, but the ejecta from Orientale, uh, from not Orientale, but South Pole Aiken. South Pole Aiken, yeah. And uh, Procolarum overlapping to give you that uh, the thicker what, crust. 100, 100 kilometer. Not, not the dichotomy so much, it's just that one area. Mm -hmm. It's possible, and this is one of the new excite, or not new, but one of the unanswered questions, and so there is you know, more work for generations to come. And if we go back to the moon and sample some of these sites directly, you know, and then we could tie in sample science again directly with all these other fields, and we can hopefully then start answering some of these, these interesting questions. Perfect timing. Let's move on. Uh, the next paper here in the sequence, uh, the co-authors are Chip Shearer, Jack Schmidt, and Brad Joliff. The talk will be presented by Chip Shearer. The title is, An Apollo Legacy Samples the Gift that Keeps on Giving to Future Generations. Great. Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my plan was to talk about the importance of samples and how powerful they were when they are combined with other data, and then examine uh, potential new Apollo samples. But that's been done. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, as has been demonstrated in the previous talks, uh, Samples and sample science over the last 50 years have really provided a valuable foundation for understanding the formation and evolution of the moon and important solar system processes. And this just illustrates six that I picked out out of 12 or 15 or 20. You know, the, um, the origin of the moon from 
uh, a wide range of elemental isotopic analyses. Uh, we now understand or we have some insights into the differentiation of not only of the moon but other planetary bodies through lunar magma ocean type processes. Uh, we further better understand from samples uh, the impact history of the inner solar system, the volatile reservoirs and cycles, volatile cycles on the moon, and space surface interactions or, or space weathering, and a far more profound understanding of magmatism, early magmatism on planetary bodies, particularly with regards uh, to the moon. So after 50 years, I'd like to make the argument that after 50 years, we still have new Apollo samples to examine uh, for now and for future generations. And I kind of group these Apollo samples in, in three categories. They can be grouped in other categories, but reevaluated samples. And these types of samples, which are samples that have been examined before, but new analytical technologies have rendered them incredibly useful. Uh, a case in point is over the last 10 years, the reanalysis of some of these pyroclastic glass beads for chlorine isotopes, uh, hydrogen content, and, and uh, uh, hydrogen and hydrogen isotopes uh, to better provide us with an understanding of the volatile cycle on the moon. Uh, also, I've listed here hidden samples uh, and then finally, special samples. And the evaluated samples and the hidden samples I'll talk about just briefly in a couple slides and really emphasize these special samples. As most of you know, uh, NASA has agreed to examine new sample, well, samples that were originally collected by Apollo but never opened. Uh, Reevaluated samples, this is just one case right here, where again, it's important to link samples, remotely sensed data, and surface mapping. And this is the case for these uh, number of Apollo 17 boulders uh, and associated rake samples. And combining those with remotely sensed data and geological mapping, uh, one can get a better understanding of the chronology, the impact chronology of the basin. I know there's a lot of controversy still with regards to how and where these boulders were derived. In addition, using new analytical approaches, one can get a better understanding of the conditions of formation. For example, using uh, determining the temperature and, and change in temperature during the melt evolution, the depth of excavation, uh, what could potentially be the impactor, and the chronology, not only of the event, but the chronology of the complete thermal history. Another group of samples that I was considering in here were the hidden samples. And these are samples that we haven't seen yet, but are there. These can occur within these breccias uh, returned by the Apollo missions. And these include, uh, as I showed here, and this will show uh, some of the information that can be extracted from these, is uh, these uh, class within these breccias. There's a small one here that's probably 200 to 300 milligrams, small basalt class in here, which again are about the same size, and using micro CT scanning of these breccias, we can identify new hidden samples to accomplish a wide range of a variety of combined analyses to better understand the origin of those class. This case is from uh, a, a series of papers by Lars Borg and I that we examined this little uh, Farron and Northside class, uh, examined the temperature, uh, its it thermal history derived from mineralogy, for example, ex solution lamellae and pyroxene, combined this with a variety of chronometers, in this case, neodymium samarium, and were able to construct not only the crystallization history but also the thermal subsolidus history of that individual class. And we can now compare it to other ferron and northocytes to better understand the, uh, what 
the fans are telling us about the lunar magma ocean. What was its duration? Uh, how well it, was it recorded in these fans? The uh, ancient, bas ancient basalts that occur in these, uh, in these other breccias provide this with some, again, uh, understanding of the mantle that they were extracted from and also uh, uh, age constraints. Some of these go are as old as about 4.3 billion years old. Uh, and this may help us resolve some questions with regards to the overall flux of, uh, of basalts and these three, and different, try to differentiate between these three different flux models and also what mantle uh, what mantle was being melted at that time. Then finally, I'm going to spend a uh, significant time here on the special Apollo samples. And, the, and, and these are the targets for this program, the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Program. And again, and again teams have been selected already to uh, do analyses of these samples. But I just wanted to point out what these samples were. First, this group of samples right here were sealed samples. They were sealed on the surface of the moon, and they range from special environmental sample containers, the SESCs, uh, the gas analysis sample containers, and the core sample vacuum containers. In addition to those sealed samples, there are other samples, frozen samples that were put in freezers once they were returned by Apollo, uh, samples that were curated and opened under helium so they were not contaminated with the nitrogen that curation commonly uses. Within this uh, set of samples, there are three that have never been opened. Uh, this sample right here, 15014, uh, 69001, 73001. And again, these are the targets, and the real target that we selected for this consortium study is 73001, a sealed sample, and 73002. Uh, this just illustrates the... Uh, the nature of these sealed samples. This is the special environmental container shown here. This is its big brother, a CSVC, that essentially uh, isolates core from the terrestrial environment. Uh, and these were sampled, cores were sampled and placed in these only in Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 and never opened. Uh, these operate by having a knife edge uh, see a uh, knife edge uh, on the can itself with an indium seal consisting of an indium silver alloy. Once the sample or core was in placed, uh, then the, uh, the, the, uh, the cap was put on and the knife edge and the indium seal supposedly sealed the sample. Uh, these were designed to accomplish a several uh, objectives, scientific objectives. One, with regards to Apollo 17, uh, the design was essentially to sample a uh, volatile record in the lunar regolith. And then also there are a wide range of other delicate lunar features in regolith samples and volcanic glasses that may be better preserved in these containers. The Apollo 17 the uh, site where this was uh, collected was in a landslide deposit shown here. Uh, and this core penetrates that landslide deposit. Uh, and the goal, the Apollo goal, was to sample the gas that may be derived from the fault underlying this landslide deposit. And this sample represents two unique characteristics. One has unique uh, uh, containment, and sampling unique geology. These samples were collected 73001 and 73002. Neither have been studied in this double drive tube. Uh, there were approximately 1.3 kilograms of sample, which again, never been examined at all. And one should maybe, maybe consider this a new mission to the moon. 
And finally, the, these, the base of this core was at fairly uh, cold conditions, suggesting that it could act as a trap for volatiles. Once returned, it was put within a, uh, a vacuum container and stored in the pristine vault where here, Ryan Ziegler and I are looking and drooling longingly at trying to get access to this. Uh, the consortium, as shown here, consists of a variety of teams bringing a variety of expertise to studying these core samples. And the types of measurements that will be done are things along the lines of conducting a preliminary examination, uh, determining the stratigraphy of these deposits, really focusing also on the distribution, different sources, behavior, and presentation or, or preservation of the volatiles within the science scope, but also in the experimental scope, really looking at how well were these samples preserved and can we do better in the future. In conclusion, examining the A17 double drive tube really is a continuation of Apollo and a bridge to our future. The whole team essentially is multi-generational that links the first generation of lunar explorers with our future. Uh, the examination of the drive tube also has implications for future exploration of the moon. And I, as I mentioned in the, the context of this talk was there are numerous new Apollo samples for future generations and the current generations. And perhaps some of these can be best studied in consortium type uh, formats such as the Apollo next generation sample analysis or survey nodes. Thank you. And while I answer questions, just a video of uh, the collection of the sample uh, on this landslide deposit. Any questions for Chip? We have, in fact. We should have a couple of minutes. Uh, Chip, uh, uh, Roy Christopherson, JSC. Uh, speaking of consortiums and breaches, uh, you know, and immediately in the post-Apollo era, there were all these formal and informal consortiums created, the Imbrium Consortium to study breaches. And I mean, don't you think it's time to revise, revive this? Um, we, there's so much we can do with coordinated analysis with a CT scanner. Um, some bre new breccia consortiums would be great. Yeah, I agree entirely. And there's so much science that can be extracted, again, from these newly discovered samples in these breccias. And as you mentioned, uh, using CT scans to identify new and unusual uh, lithologies or lithologies that may be very relevant to understanding the crust itself uh, and subsequent periods of magmatism would be extremely valuable. So I, I, I highly, I agree with you entirely. Okay, I think that's it for that's questions. It. Oh. I think no one's gonna wanna preempt the, the video here. <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and move on. And uh, uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the bridge of this spacecraft over to my co-chair, Louise Proctor. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so we are now moving away from the crust a little bit into the filling. Uh, <laughs> the next talk is going to be um, given by Maria Zuba, and the title is Geophysics and Shallow Internal Structure of the Moon. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Louise. Um, I'm so honored uh, to be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the conveners for the invitation to all of my colleagues, students, and postdocs uh, who worked on all this data and to everybody who was involved in collecting all of the data sets that we have here today. So, um, so I'm going to mainly be talking about gravity and topography, but uh, one of my conclusions about what there is to do in the future in this field really comes from this slide. And this uh, this tells us about the fact that uh, when we have uh, geophysical data sets, we can make models, but there's an infinity of solutions that satisfy uh, the data sets, and unless um, we have good information to put in it, and this includes remote sensing information, it includes experimental information in the lab, it includes an analysis of the samples, um, these, uh, these data sets don't have value and these models don't have value, and I think 
that the scientific community here hasn't fully come to grips with the fact that we have global geophysical data sets that are geodetically referenced at better than five kilometers resolution for the entire moon. So there's just an infinity of opportunities of new things that we can, uh, that we can learn. Um, so uh, it wasn't a surprise that the lunar crust was fractured because of, we see all the impact craters. Um, but it certainly was a big surprise, I think, that the lunar crust was fr fractured as much as it was. And um, so I'd like to go through the evidence for a, a fractured lunar crust. And um, so the first of those is um, if uh, a picture tells a thousand words. Uh, on the left is a map of uh, Lola topography of the far side of the moon. And the right is the Grail gravity uh, map. And these are two completely independent data sets, yet they look uh, entirely similar. Okay? And so what that tells you is that at least at the short wavelengths, uh, most of the gravity can be explained by the topography. And, um, and we can um, look at that more quantitatively here in this plot of coherence. And um, this is basically a comparison of gravity to what the gravity would be if all the gravity were due to topography. Okay? So if it's one, they correlate uh, completely, and all of the gravity can be explained by topography. And uh, down here, these are uh, long wavelengths, and we go to short wavelengths up here. And on the right-hand side here, um, we break out uh, the near side and the far side. And uh, in, the, uh, in the highlands, in the lunar highlands, more than 99% of the gravity signal is explained by short at short wavelengths from topography. And on the near side, because of the Mare Basin's complicating things, uh, it's only um, about 97%. Okay? And um, so what this is telling us is that only one, you know, one to two percent of the gravity that we see at short to mid wavelengths is associated with the crust. So it tells us that the crust is incredibly well mixed, and the way that it was well mixed um, was because of, uh, of uh, impact gardening. Um, so um, another thing that we can do, because now we know that the crust is well mixed, um, we look at Bouguer gravity, and that's what the gravity is when we strip away gravity associated with topography. And, um, and if we guess the density right of the crust, then the Bouguer gravity is going to be zero. Okay? And, um, and so by minimizing the Bouguer gravity, we can solve for surface density. And, um, and this is a map of uh, surface density. And um, without going into the details here, um, the, uh, the density on the surface that we see uh, tends to correlate with uh, variations in surface composition. Now, what we can do is uh, we can do that same calculation, but break it into different wave bands and look at how the density varies um, with depth. So this is a plot of uh, density on this axis here um, associated with spherical harmonic degree or depth. And what we found, um, and this is uh, uh, from uh, Mark Wazorek's uh, et al.'s paper um, in science, was that the average density of the lunar crust, we had it wrong. Okay? It's uh, 2550. It's less than the density of a northosite. And that's because the crust is fractured. Uh, up. So things get complicated down here um, when we get to greater depths because we're seeing um, basically the effects of thinning of the crust under major lunar basins. Um, we see uh, things getting even less dense when we get uh, up towards the surface. Um, but now um, we know um, the density of the crust. Now, if we, um, if we know uh, the density that we measure, and we know the bulk density of, uh, of a northosite, um, then we can solve for the porosity. And we find that in the, um, and we, again, we can do this at different wave bands over depths, but we um, see that the average porosity of the moon, um, at least down to several kilometers, is about 12%. And here you get a really good sense of uh, greater porosity occurring in association with the large impact basins. So here's another area of the, where great progress could be made in the future, and that is using these variations of porosity data um, to tell us about the, basically the energy partitioning in these large impacts, how much of this, uh, how much of this energy is going into uh, fracturing of the, of the uh, lunar surface. 
Um, now, looking at some work that uh, Walter Kiefer did um, in preparation for the uh, GRAIL mission, um, and that's uh, taking um, measurements of the lunar samples of the porosity and density. And, um, and what we can see here is, um, I consider this to be, it's, maybe it's not surprising, but it's, it's kind of amazing. And that's that the, the lunar samples now, the density and the porosity, agree very well with the, date, with the GRAIL data. So we, we actually have ground truth on the moon that is very consistent with the global geophysical data set. So, so I think now, for the first time after this, we are on a firm foundation of understanding the basic properties of the outer part um, of the moon. So, um, so uh, crustal thickness models have been, um, uh, estimates of crustal thickness on the moon have been developed since the Apollo days. And in fact, the Apollo seismometers were used to um, determine the, um, the uh, uh, crustal uh, thickness of the moon. And it was 60 kilometers. But now um, it's somewhere between 34 and 43 kilometers. And you know, aside from measuring um, lunar samples, um, they also can get the uh, density out of the P waves and the S waves um, from the uh, Apollo seismics. But uh, beneath the maria, as you're going to see in a minute, that is not characteristic of lunar crust. So densities that were measured, uh, estimated in that way, um, weren't, uh, weren't the right densities. So if you put the right densities in the models, you get a much lower um, uh, uh, thickness, average thickness of crust. Um, we can use the aluminum content in the crust, back out the aluminum content in the mantle. mantle. Um, we see that the aluminum now, uh, or the, in uh, the moon, is comparable to that of Earth. And that was actually one of the pieces of information that went into uh, models that Robin talked about uh, in the uh, refining the uh, 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 impact origin of the moon um, analysis. And you saw the examples that, um, that she um, presented on that. Um, so now here is a plot of the second horizontal derivative of the, uh, of the Bouguer potential. And, um, and this allows us to look for um, some of those, uh, some of that 1% variation um, in the crust of the moon. And, um, and in the little box here, okay, this is work that uh, Jeff Andrews Hanna led, is um, we see uh, evidence for dikes within the crust of the moon. Um, these are large dikes, uh, 5 to 25 kilometers wide, 10 to 70 kilometers deep or so. And, um, and there is no evidence for them um, in the surface. And, um, and so this is evidence for early expansion of the moon. We had the hot magma ocean warmed the interior of the moon. The moon expands. Um, this was actually predicted in a 1977 paper by Sean Solomon, but no evidence had ever been found for it, found of it. So it wasn't until we looked beneath the surface um, that we actually saw that um, evidence. Now, um, now here's a, a, a kind of near side focused um, uh, plot of uh, um, topography over here, and then um, uh, Bouguet uh, or the gravity gradients over here. And um, and what this reveals is uh, is basically a large system of dikes that underlies uh, the Maria. And here, this essentially this is the the plumbing system that uh, uh, allowed um, Mari basalts to reach the surface. Um, you notice when you look at this, so, and, and actually these angles are the angles that you would predict if these were cooling cracks on a sphere. Okay? Um, what you don't see here is evidence for a procolarum impact. Okay? It doesn't say a procolarum impact didn't occur, but it says that if it did occur, um, the evidence for it had been wiped out. So the question that arose later about that excess thickness of crust on the far side, we still don't know whether that's impact related or whether there were variations in the intensity of melting um, that occurred um, associated with the magma ocean. OK, so uh, let's see. Next slide. So uh, no one yet has addressed the origin of mascons. And that was really one of the driving questions of the, the GRAIL mission. Um, this will be the, the, the last topic that I talk about. And, um, and so, uh, so the MASCONS stands for mass concentrations, and they tugged the early uh, satellites, lunar orbiters, around in their orbit when we first started um, 
exploring the moon to look for landing sites. And, um, and the, uh, the mascons, when we got more detailed gravity of them, um, uh, a gravity bullseye in the middle, surrounded by negative gravity, surrounded by positive gravity, so you essentially saw a bullseye. So as part of GRAIL, um, Jay Malosh and Andy Freed um, looked at two basins, um, a uh, Freundlich Sharonov, which is a, a, an unfilled basin, and Humorum, which is a Mari basin, and, um, and they ran hydrocodes and then finite element models to look at relaxation and settling. And, um, and here this white shows you um, what the gravity would be like after the basin was excavated and the collapse occurred. Um, the data set, the points here, these are uh, grail data across the basins. So that doesn't explain it. But the red um, actually does explain the data after isostatic adjustment and cooling takes place. So that's part of the process. And then over here, the blue line corresponds to uh, after Mari filling. That's what the gravity looks like. So we now can explain both filled and unfilled basins and factors like kinetic energy, uh, thermal gradient, and crustal thickness um, are um, important in describing the gravity signal. And so we now have uh, a model that we kind of understand about uh, excavation, um, material gets thrown out, it has to isostatically adjust, there's cooling associated with it, and um, so the flow and the relaxation of the crust and mantle turns out to be critical um, in um, the, uh, uh, explaining the mask on signal. And this is my, um, this is my uh, final um, chart, and this underscores, again, another area where we have to have new, where we need to have um, additional new work. And this is the coherence pattern for the moon and the other terrestrial planets. So here's Mars, uh, Mercury here, um, and Earth. And, uh, and nothing else looks anything like the moon, okay? And so maybe Venus and Earth shouldn't look like the moon, but Mercury should like, look like the moon, and Mars should look like the moon because the crust is very fractured. And, um, and do these things not look like the moon because they're not, they don't have, they're not like the moon in terms of the crust and the fracturing that goes on, or are they not like the moon because we don't have the right kind of data yet? And so, so I think there's just an abundance of work that needs to be done to sort out those questions, including collecting um, new data from uh, both the moon and other terrestrial planets. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time okay. for questions right now. Oh, that's so too bad. Okay. encourage okay. people to okay. go ask Maria okay. later. Thank you. So moving even further into the interior, the next talk is titled The Moon's Deep Interior, a Hotbed for Seismicity and the Question of Partial Melt. And the speaker is Renee Weber. Hello, everyone. And first, I would like to say uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Uh, thank you to the audience for your attendance. And thank you to all of the many authors whose works I am about to refer to as I talk about the uh, Apollo legacy as it pertains to geophysics and the deep interior of the moon. Uh, at the dawn of the age of planetary exploration, seismology was really considered a key technique for understanding the interior of a planet. And seismometers were actually among the first instruments that were ever taken to the surface of other planets. Uh, both to the moon with Apollo and to Mars with Viking. And pictured here is Buzz Aldrin with the Apollo 11 seismic experiment, uh, which laid the groundwork for the first long-lived extraterrestrial geophysical network. Uh, and uh, Apollo really, under, uh, really revolutionized our understanding of the lunar interior. But there are still many outstanding questions remaining uh, regarding the detailed global structure of the moon's deep interior, which of course has bearing on its thermal, petrological, and rotational history. So the terrestrial planets all share a common structural framework across the mantle and a core, which is developed very shortly after the planet's formation and which determines its subsequent evolution. And interior properties, including layering, composition, seismic velocity, density, the presence or not of partial melt, and the state of the core, all provide possible indicators for an early dynamo uh, for magnetic field generation. 
And constraints on these properties arise from primarily geophysical observations, including the geodetic parameters, lunar laser ranging, the gravity field of the moon, magnetic induction studies, heat flow, and of course, seismology. And I'm just gonna step through these observations one by one and talk a little bit about the knowledge that we've gained about the interior from each one of them. So from the moon's geodetic parameters uh, to first order, the moon's moment of inertia is roughly approximated by a homogeneous sphere. So we know that if a core is present, it must be very small. Uh, but we, of course, know that the real moon has these global hemispherical dichotomies, both in crustal thickness, uh, volcanism, magnetism, and the distribution of heat-producing elements. And one uh, sort of large question is how, whether and how these dichotomies propagate into the interior. So from lunar laser ranging, uh, lunar laser ranging has been continuously precisely monitoring the moon's geodetic parameters since 1969 with the installation of the Apollo and Luna uh, retro reflectors. And the round trip laser travel time to the moon provides information about the rotation uh, from which you can back out information on the distribution of mass within the planet. And dissipation actually provided the first laser, lunar laser ranging evidence for a fluid core. And if you make some assumptions about the composition of the core, you can back out uh, a radius. So for magnetic induction uh, and electrical conduct, the electrical conductivity measured by magnetic induction and electromagnetic sounding uh, provide constraints on mantle temperature and chemistry. And uh, these were constrained both at single points at the Apollo stations and with concurrent uh, surface and orbital magnetometer measurements. And both the later lunar prospector and Kaguya magnetometers detected an induced moment within the moon. And if you assume that that moment is due entirely to uh, currents at the surface of a highly electrically conducting magnet, uh, metallic core, you can also make some constraints on its size. And of course, uh, seismic measurements, the area where I am most familiar. Uh, of course, we had the, the seismic network that was emplaced through uh, Apollo 12 through 16, the passive seismic network, which collected about eight continuous years of seismic data. And uh, I, I should point out that the, the highly scattering properties of the regolith of the moon uh, sort of create lunar seismograms that are not as good quality as, as uh, their modern terrestrial uh, counterparts. And there are subsequently a lot of uncertainty in the seismic velocity models that the Apollo seismic experiments uh, created. And uh, as Maria already pointed out, um, crustal thickness estimates have actually been decreasing over the years, not because of a physical process on the moon, but because newer and more computationally expensive techniques have been applied to the data. And early uh, models that are based purely on the inversion of seismic travel times have been supplanted or supplemented by newer models that use uh, more complex uh, methods. And to first order, the models mostly agree that the only major discernible discontinuity in the interior is the crust mantle interface around 30 kilometers deep. And I would argue that there's not really a current consensus among models regarding the presence of a mid-mantle seismic discontinuity. And this is important because this has been used in the past to possibly suggest the lower bound of an ancient magma ocean. Uh, so another thing to point out is that none of the models I just showed uh, go any deeper than the base of the mantle. And the reason for this is because we don't have any seismic rays that penetrate the core. Uh, and, and so this, this here is just a, a cross section of the moon. You can see the seismic stations were, of course, all deployed on the near side. Uh, so the reason that we don't see any seismic energy penetrating through the core could either be because the far side is aseismic, which I think is highly unlikely, or that there is a core that is highly attenuating to seismic energy. And uh, we can use the depths of the deep moonquakes to roughly constrain uh, a radius of the core also. And so, of course, there have been more recent advances in lunar geophysics. Uh, the GRAIL lunar gravity mission mapped the gravity field in extreme detail and provided very tight constraints on the shallow crustal structure. Um, but as Maria also mentioned, those constraints are tied to the uh, ground truth from Apollo, um, which are still somewhat uncertain. 
And recent work done uh, both by me and by my colleague Rafael Garcia, uh, reanalyzing Apollo seismic data, looking not for rays that go through the core, but rather rays that reflect off of it, um, were used to place constraints on on a seismic constraint, direct seismic constraint on the size of the core, and also argue both for, in my work, and against, in Raphael's work, uh, the presence of a partial melt layer uh, above the liquid outer core. And subsequent um, works have offered different, differing perspectives on whether or not that partial melt layer is really required to satisfy all of the available constraints. So all of the measurements that I've talked about so far have synergy with geothermal measurements, which track heat production and the temperature distribution in the interior. Uh, the Apollo heat flow experiments were both in this area dominated by a thorium-rich crust and, the, and possibly provide information about the evolution of the lunar dynamo uh, by which the moon may have generated and maintained its own magnetic field. And um, of course, Apollo samples record the moon's magnetic history, which strongly suggest that the moon once sustained a dynamo. And we're really just beginning to constrain its nature with numerical modeling. And dynamo history can also be constrained with paleomagnetism and crustal magnetism studies. But we don't know the exact origin of the moon's magnetic anomalies. And I've just pictured here one of the enigmatic swirl features. So uh, uh, the big question is, how do we develop an internal structure model that is consistent with all of the available observations? Obviously, complex internal processes drive the distribution of surface observables. And there are a lot of outstanding questions on what is a, a consistent model. And I'll, I'll just reiterate some of those here. Um, we don't know the full nature of the extinct lunar dynamo. We don't know the exact origin of the moon's crustal magnetic anomalies. We don't have unambiguous observations of a mid-mantle discontinuity, a partial melt layer, or an inner core. We don't know how surface hemispherical dichotomies propagate into the interior. And to some extent, we don't understand why some moonquakes occur. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of detail about that. So we know that deep moonquakes, which are occurring about halfway to the center of the moon, are somehow related to tides, possibly triggered by tides. Um, but the tidal stress at this depth is not enough to fracture unbroken rock. And, and furthermore, deep moonquakes are occurring at a depth that should be below the brittle ductile transition within the moon. So why do we see these events that look like brittle failure in the ductile regime? And on the, on the shallow quake side, uh, there, the, these events were, were very large compared to deep moonquakes, but also very relatively rare. And uh, there has been some suggestion in recent work that these could possibly be related to slip on lobate scarps or other tectonic features on the surface. And, and there have been some other, some weirder mechanisms proposed. Um, but, but if all of this is starting to sound like uh, an elaborate setup justifying a future lunar geophysical network, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, building from Apollo's legacy, uh, which really, I think, uh, evolved our understanding of the moon from a cold, dead place to a much more dynamic and active place, uh, to, to build upon that legacy, the National Research Council recommends a lunar geophysical network in the current decadal survey. A uh, lunar geophysical network would be a, a network of at least four nodes operating continuously for a long period of time, the longer the better each node consisting of a seismometer, a heat flow probe, a retroreflector, and a magnetometer. And uh, un unfortunately, I can't tell you to come see the Lunar Geophysical Network poster because it was last night. Uh, but if you want to read the abstract, you can go look for number 2455. And um, this, this mission is currently in formulation for New Frontiers 5. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions. Jack. Uh, I, I'm just, this is historical because so much more has been done. But my recollection is that while the network was active, that uh, there was a far side impact, then it, the interpretation of the signal from that impact indicated uh, that P waves had been absorbed through a core. And there was an original estimate from the network 
of a core size. Yep. Based, am I correct in my memory? Uh, I think so, yeah. The, the problem, again, there with the, the scattering properties of the regolith that really make those first arrival determinations very difficult uh, makes uh, the constraints that come from the very early seismic studies highly uncertain. Well, I understand. And also, I thought that those, uh, when the network was active, the interpretation of the deep moon quake signal was that it was fluid motion in response to tides, such as an iron shelf or liquid or something in the, in the deep interior. Could be. They're, they're, that's one of the outstanding questions that we need this mission to address. Okay, any other, other questions? Actually, I have a question. So, um, obviously, this would be a fantastic mission, the Lunar Geophysical Network. Uh, what could you do if you could just have one sensor on the surface, like insight to style? That would be fantastic, and that's something that we hope to look at as we uh, progress with planning. And, and where would you put it? Uh, good question. <laughs> we, we would want to put it somewhere where we can maximize the chances of detecting an event from one of the moonquake sources that we already know to exist from Apollo. Um, but we could also have the opportunity to observe new sources that we've never seen before. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we'll move on. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm sure we can use it. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next talk is titled Global Composition of the Moon as We're Learning to Know It, and the speaker is Carly Peters. Well, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, this is a very exciting time. Jack, has it only been 50 years? Well, I, I certainly challenge all the younger people in the audience to be thinking of the next 50 years and all the fantastic science that's going to happen. Um, I'm going to start with another view of the moon. These are two hemispheres of the moon that should be well familiar to all of you. However, you're probably scratching your head because it's not familiar areas you see. What this was taken was with the Lola laser altimeter. So you're looking at the moon from the North Pole and the South Pole with zero, zero shadows. Um, and it's the, the one from the South Pole is one of the few views where you can see both South Pole, Aiken, and Tycho in the same hemisphere. OK. Um, moving ahead, uh, I'm going to be talking very uh, rapidly through the characteristics of the uh, uh, global properties of the moon. Uh, there's obviously a lot of unanswered questions that are associated with this, but mostly I will be focusing on the compositional properties that we know for both the basalts and the ancient crust. Um, so let's uh, quickly go through the basalts. Um, that, as has been already mentioned, the first lander uh, identified some ancient titanium-rich basalts. The second lander, within a year, uh, identified low titanium basalts that were slightly younger. Um, um, it wasn't until the very last sample returned by the former Soviet Union, after Apollo was finished, that we found that there was very low titanium basalts uh, uh, as a major unit across the surface. And of course, with uh, Apollo 17 uh, and Jack's discovery of the orange uh, soil, um, we recognize the importance of pyroclastic materials that now uh, are recognized throughout the Apollo sample. Uh, so this is a very brief history of some of the volcanic uh, aspects of uh, lunar uh, exploration in the samples. What I'll be focusing mostly on is the crust um, and some of the important things that we've learned uh, about both the composition of the crust in a global, global scale um, uh, and, and what it means for future exploration. Um, of course, as has already been mentioned, almost all the samples from the highland crust are breccias. These are mixed, uh, lithified components that are pieces of crust within pieces of crust. Um, a few hand samples are, are pristine, um, uh, single lithologies, but most are these wonderful mixed treasure troves uh, that, as, as Chip says, has lots of hidden wonderful samples even within them, and sample techniques are able to address. 
Um, so this rubble concept uh, has been addressed uh, looking at basins and how basins redistribute material. Uh, it, the highland crust is essentially a couple of kilometers of this broken material that has been mixed uh, through the era that has been described in the geochronology earlier today. Okay, so the golden age was the Apollo period. It wasn't a couple, until a couple of decades later that we had uh, uh, a few small missions sent to the moon that um, gave us a global assessment, the first global assessment uh, of the moon. Um, and you've seen many of these already. I'm not going to reiterate them, just to remind you that uh, this was several uh, decades after Apollo that we were able to start putting things in a global context. And again, to remind you that little dark circles is where Apollo uh, samples were acquired. This is extended with the Luna samples a little bit further, but it's a very limited part of the crust that we have samples for currently. Okay, um, what I'll be spending most of the time in the discussion is, is results from the more recent detailed exploration that happened only about a decade ago as new missions were sent with modern instruments by a host of countries, um, including the United States, um, um, and is continuing up to the present day with one asset that we still have in, in in lunar orbit, lunar LRO, and Noah will talk about that at the end. Uh, but we also have new landings that is happening even on the far side of the moon as we speak. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about all these squiggly lines a lot, um, but I do want to, to mention one of the first things I'm gonna talk about is the plagioclase, and that's, that's a very distinctive uh, spectral property. Okay, so let's go to the the Pharaoh and our site, the anorthocytic part of the crust that we can see with remote sensing. Now, prior to the, the advanced sensor era, um, we had uh, telescopic measurements of, of the near side of the moon. The way we identified um, feldspathic material uh, was high albedo and no mafic mineral absorption. There was no features, um, and this was the way we identified the presence of anorthosite on the moon. Now, from a spectroscopy, that's a little hard because it's saying we're looking for nothing in order to identify something. Um, but everything changed with the new uh, experiments that are, uh, were sent to the moon, namely that there is this diagnostic property that I showed you very quickly in all those squiggly lines that clearly identifies the presence of crystalline plagioclase at certain areas on the moon. Um, uh, one of the first papers that uh, put this in a spatial context was the one from the, the uh, Kagayu mission. Uh, you may remember the wonderful uh, discussion of the uh, central peaks of Jackson Crater, which clearly identified in the spatial context the presence of crystalline plagioclase in mountain size, not just a fragment, mountains, huge mountains of uh, this very pure anorthosite. Um, uh, M cube, of course, found, sort of simultaneously found similar things. Uh, the example I show here is as we traversed across the Oriental Basin. And it wasn't everywhere at Oriental, but at the innermost ring, which is where we saw the most pristine examples of the, this highly pristine um, uh, 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 pure anorthosite. Uh, elsewhere within the basin and the deposits, we see this breccia, as, as I will come back to. Um, but within the inner ring, we see a, a massive exposure of pure anorthosite. OK, um, pure anorthosite, uh, of course, has been uh, examined now with, with the global aspects of these experiments. Um, and and uh, I show two uh, summary from both the Kagaya and the M-cube. Uh, they're global in nature, and if you compare these, we basically see the same thing. It's wonderful, uh, although independently derived with, with uh, completely independent um, uh, missions. Uh, let's look in more detail at the uh, uh, Oriental Basin. Here's uh, this particular example, uh, Leah Cheek looked across the basin and looked for any examples of a crater or outcrop that showed any diagnostic features at all. And that's what all the points are. Then she categorized them according to where the crystalline plagioclase, the red points, uh, are compared to these more breccia mixed zones. And what you can see is the concentration of the pure north site with the inner ring of the Oriental Basin. Okay, so that's the uh, 
pure and orthocyte, let's move on to the low calcium pyroxene, which dominates the highland megaregolith, this kilometers of broken rubble that we see mostly. Um, here's a lovely study that Paul Lucy and several of his associates uh, did. They looked at very small craters, um, which only sampled the megaregolith um, and, and asked, okay, what kind of uh, mafic mineral occur there? And they found they, they uh, were in two different groups, and for those of you who know spectroscopy, those that have a shorter wavelength are the low calcium or magnesium rich component, and those that have longer wavelengths are the high calcium. This clearly separates into the Mari for the high calcium pyroxenes and the uh, highlands for the, the, uh, low, the magnesium rich pyroxenes. And these are small fresh craters, that was a key issue. This is the, the distribution of samples that uh, Lucy et al. Uh, obtained, um, and again, the, the distribution of the Marian highlands. But if you take that uh, uh, highland area and examine just the craters within South Pole Aiken and the, the northern uh, high, uh, feldspathic terrain, you see they both fall into the uh, uh, um, highland terrain, but are clearly separated with the far side feldspathic terrain having the shortest or most magnesium rich pyroxenes as incorporated into the megaregolith. Okay, so what does that say? That, that suggests then very strongly that this megaregolith is a mixture of the plagioclase and the lo low calcium or magnesium rich pyroxene uh, essentially globally across the moon. And because these are basin association, that means that the lower crust or perhaps upper mantle that the basins tapped and mixed into the uh, character uh, is dominated by this low calcium or magnesium rich pyroxene. Well, let's look at the largest basin to see what, how that fits into all this. The largest basin, again, is quite consistent across the uh, different approaches. Uh, what I show here is first the Kagyu assessment, and within South Pole Aiken, we see this magnesium-rich pyroxene as the predominant exposure across the basin. We see essentially the same thing looking at M cubed data. It, with M cubed data, we have both bands, and we can uh, compare the character of the pyroxene. Um, and most of the interior basin, the non-basaltic areas, are the magnesium-rich pyroxene exposures. Okay, so the largest basin in South Pole Aiken exposes magnesium-rich materials. Again, apparently the upper mantle tapped by this large basin is largely noritic or magnesium-rich pyroxenes. Okay, what about the role of olivine and magnesium spinel? You've already heard uh, pieces and discussions of uh, both of these. Uh, they, these, of course, are the gem quality, which we don't quite have in Apollo samples yet, but maybe the next generation will collect them. Um, the olivine, of course, we knew um, from telescopic measurements of, uh, of the near side, even in the central peaks of Copernicus, is full of uh, uh, olivine and troctolite. Early on, if you haven't looked at it, there's a Marvin and Walker paper that looked at a Apollo sample from Apollo 12, which has all the characteristics of a troctolite that was shocked probably came from uh, uh, Copernicus, and it has the FO of 89. Uh, again, shown here is a, a map of the distribution of where olivine or olivine-bearing materials are distributed across the, the surface of, of the moon. They're global. Um, olivine, typically associated with plagioclase, uh, occurs as a component uh, in diverse locations. However, not it's very rare at the biggest basin, South Pole Aiken. Okay, magnesium spinel. Uh, this was the new kid on the block, as was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, it, it's, it appears uh, uh, is a uh, it, it, it was first discovered at the Muscoviense Basin, which is the inner ring of the Muscoviense Basin. It's, uh, it was found in association with both a few areas of neuritic as well as olivine-rich materials. Um, in, in doing a global assessment of this, mater this material, the magnesium spinel, uh, it is found globally across the, the, the uh, planet associated with basins and with basin uh, ejecta. Um, uh, 
appears to be apparently associated with the, the formation of the magnesium suite on the moon. Okay. Uh, global feldspathic mega regolith. Okay. So, what are the summary? Um, Pure anorthosite is global and is exposed at base and rings as a massive crustal component. Um, Magnesium-rich pyroxene is global and is the principal mafic mineral of the pervasive feldspathic megaregolith uh, breaches and presumably the upper mantle or certainly lower crust. Olivine troctolite is global. Uh, it occurs with plagioclase in diverse locations, um, often near basins, but rare in the biggest one, namely rare in South Pole Aiken. Magnesium, <coughs> excuse me, magnesium spinel is global, but occurs as a minor component uh, in, uh, in basins, uh, along with feldspathic megaregolith. So what is the unfinished business? These areas are global, but I've given you a very broad uh, brush. Um, what, what these new advanced sensors uh, allowed us to do is identify specific unsampled outcrops of some of these components. These are mountain-sized components with each of the ones that I, I mentioned. We can map, we know sensors can map them, or we don't have a detailed assessment of this, but certainly the next generation of lunar exploration will document, and I hope inventory, how these pieces fit together. So with that, um, it's up to you to continue the story. Okay, we have time for one question, I think. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, um, my name's Tim Fagan. I'm from Waseda University, and okay. I have a comment and a question. To your, the comment is to your timeline of the missions, I would add the first discovery of lunar meteorites uh, in determining oh, yeah. the composition of the, of the, of the crust. Mm. And my question regards the South Pole Aiken and why there's no, so olivine is so rare there. And if you would uh, just comment on a couple of ideas, why that might be. Well, the, the current comp, uh, idea, which is a really wonderful integration of samples and geophysics and, and remote sensing, is that maybe, maybe the upper uh, um, mantle is not olivine dominated. Maybe it's, it's dominated by the more magnesium rich pyroxenes. Um, that's one. The other is maybe we just haven't uh, sampled the right thing. Maybe a third is that maybe South Pole Aiken is unusual and that, that it has, what we're looking at is a melt that has altered and we would not, never see the olivine. So those, I don't know which of those are correct. I have my opinion, but. Go ahead. Um, your, your response to the question actually raises another question. If the upper mantle is depleted in olivine, or however you phrased it, then how do you get olivine in the central peaks of small craters like Copernicus? Oh, oh well, we know olivine exists. We know that in the samples. Um, um, and if you look at the diagrams, there's always olivine in the magnesium suite. Um, um, but what we don't know is the abundance and where they are. And that was sort of the point I was trying to make in the very last comment is that th we, there are these lithologies that we can see across the moon and our technology now is able to start mapping them and how they're related to each other and we don't have the answer to that yet. We need more samples and more remote measurements. Right. I think Thank I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, our next talk is titled Anatomy of the Lunar Water Exosphere. Uh, the authors are Hurley, Prem, Banner, Vondrak, Farrell, et al. Oh, and a few others, Hendricks and Lucy, according to this. And the talk will be given by Dana Hurley. Hi. Uh, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about volatiles on the moon. Um, so back before the Apollo uh, era, uh, Watson Murray Brown uh, just wrote this seminal paper discussing the possibility that you can have water ice in the polar regions of the moon. Uh, they studied the stability of water ice uh, at very low temperatures and found that um, without other removal processes, you could have uh, water ice stable um, for the um, lifetime of the obliquity of the moon. Um, then 
after Apollo, we still were wondering about the um, possibility of ice, or of ice in the polar regions of the moon. It seemed like the rest of the moon was pretty dry. Um, but still, Arnold uh, was talking about all the different sources that could contribute to any ice that's in the polar regions of the moon. And even uh, brought about by the Apollo sample analysis was the um, idea that solar wind or water could be produced on the moon um, you know, in the current epoch by the reduction of the, um, the iron oxides into nanophase iron and um, releasing that as water. So in 1979, um, you know, the question of the presence of water in these coal traps remained open, but, uh, and it could be settled by experiment. So um, fast forward <laughs> to um, the late 90s, those experiments actually began with Clementine and Lunar Prospector. But a lot of progress has been made in the last decade, and I'll call it the LRO decade, but as we know, there are many spacecraft that um, have contributed to our understanding of water and volatiles on the moon. But here are some of the, uh, the data from the polar regions of the moon that are all indicating that you do have water ice in the lunar polar regions. There's the, this is the south pole of the moon, all three of these, um, and different sizes, but those three craters are those three craters, are those three craters. And um, what's really, really interesting is that even if you're looking uh, in the laser reflectance data, if you're looking in the um, ultraviolet, if you're looking with neutrons, uh, all of those are consistent with the presence of water ice uh, in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. However, they give different indications about the distribution. So, for example, in the uh, UV data, there seems to be a lot of uh, water frost on the surface there, uh, but practically none in this crater, as opposed to the neutrons, which, since the amount of hydrogen in the top meter, there's a lot of hydrogen in this crater. And so that's telling us that this water ice distribution is very heterogeneous. We also have uh, data from M cubed that was looking into the permanently shadowed regions that Schweili analyzed that show um, water frost on the surface in many of the permanently shadowed regions. We also have data so now that we know that the water is in the permanently shadowed regions, the question is, how did it get there? Uh, and we have some data that are looking at uh, volatiles outside of the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. There were observations by um, Deep Impact and um, Cassini and, um, and M cubed, all indicating that there is some hydration on the surface of the moon, even in the daytime when the temperatures are high where water ice is not stable, so it's more adsorb water particles um, just to the extreme surface of uh, the moon. And uh, this water seems to be changing on a daily time scale. Uh, and then we also have data from Laddie that detected spikes of water in the moon's exosphere. And this here shows the time series of the water data from Laddie from the exosphere, um, where it's very stochastic. You have just these events where the water reading is elevated, and those events all seem to align with um, meteoroid streams that the moon is passing through. So this indicates that meteoroids are releasing water into the moon's exosphere. But there are times when the uh, value is down at a background level. Indicate, and if you set an upper limit to the amount of water in the exosphere based on those uh, low measurements, you have an upper limit outside of these meteoroid streams of um, less than one per cc at altitude of water. So the big questions that are the ones that we're considering now 
are, you know, what are the characteristics of the hydration on the daylight, daylight, daylight uh, surface? Do you have water uh, migrating around and um, changing on a diurnal basis? And then for the modern contributions to um, potential water in the cold traps, you know, are micrometeoroids uh, and the solar wind contributing to uh, the cold traps? Um, and are those tied to those signatures of hydration that we see on the daylit surface? And then what is the relationship to that water that we, water ice we are seeing in the permanently shadowed regions to the processes that are going on um, on the rest of the moon right now? So I do what I always do, I model it. Um, I can give you some more details about the model, but I'm just gonna look at some models of that water exosphere of the moon and try to place some limits on how we can use those observations to answer some of those big questions. Um, so I run the model for several different configure, or, um, parameters of how the exosphere acts. And the first set of simulations here are when you assume that water gets released into the exosphere, but once it lands back on the surface, it can't leave again. So this is where migration is not efficient. You're not gonna get a lot of delivery to the polar regions from this, but you have water that gets released um, and then it gets set back down. So in this simulation, uh, I did one where you have meteoroids releasing your water and then one where you have solar wind releasing your water. And all these plots are a function of local time and latitude, it's only one hemisphere because it's symmetric north-south. But you can see that the local time distribution of your water exosphere basically reflects the local time distribution of the source. There's a higher source rate of meteoroids on the dawn side, so that's where you see the water. Um, for a solar wind, the highest source rate is going to be close to noon, so that's where you'll see your water. And if you take the model predictions here in the equatorial region where Laddie flew, where we set that upper limit of one per cc. In order to have the average value in that equatorial region equal that, the source rates for both meteoroids and solar wind is tenths of a gram per second of water released into the exosphere, which is a really small fraction of the amount of water and or hydrogen that's delivered by these um, sources. So if you have data that gives you the local time distribution of, um, of your water exosphere, and if you know that there's no migration because uh, it's one of these profiles, you can actually separate out the amount of water that's being contributed by solar wind and the amount that's being contributed by meteoroids by looking at these local time profiles. And the uh, density that you have uh, in the early morning is going to be uh, mostly produced by meteoroids, and the amount you have over here uh, in the afternoon is going to be mostly coming from solar wind. So by comparing those, you can um, distinguish the amounts coming from each source. Now in the model, if you allow the water molecules to hop, and after they're released, they land back on the surface and they can keep on hopping uh, once the temperature is high enough to release them from the surface, uh, you get a very different looking exosphere. So these were the figures we looked at before without hopping. And when you add hopping in, one thing, first of all, is that there is no real difference between the exosphere produced by meteoroids and by solar wind. So you've erased the signatures from the source because the particles live on and they tend to concentrate um, near dawn. Uh, if we change that activation energy um, that the water molecules have with the surface, then um, it changes the distribution of the exosphere. So if you use a low activation energy, you have your uh, intense exosphere 
at the Dawn Terminator, but if you raise that X or activation energy and the surface is, is stickier, then your uh, exosphere moves closer to noon and it um, is constrained to the low latitudes. So we can use the, if migration is occurring on the moon and we have these data, we can use the um, uh, location of that enhancement to really understand the um, interaction with the surface. So this simulation where we have um, a higher activation energy is actually pretty consistent with the most recent LAMP um, observations of surface uh, hydration where you get a, deplet a depletion in the surface hydration very close to noon. That was, that's very or indicative of a sticky surface. So if this is really what's going on, the source rate implied by this is extremely low. And so we have known water and um, hydrogen being brought by meteoroids and solar wind that is not being released into the exosphere water. So now the question is what's happening to those sources? So um, I'll just go on to the conclusions and um, say that lunar water exospheric measurements are a really interesting way to try to understand both um, the sources of water to the moon and the interactions of uh, water with the surface. And then that can tell us a lot about whether ongoing processes are uh, significant contributions to the water that we've observed in the permanently shadowed regions of the pole. So thank you. Questions for Dana, Giovanni. Hello, oh. uh, just one quick question. Uh, Giovanni Leone from University of Atacama. Uh, I did not well understand what is the balance between the water coming in and the water coming out. So what is the situation? Right, so um, we know, for example, that there's solar wind hitting the surface of the moon. And we know that some of it's going back out as energetic neutral hydrogen, some of it's get recombining into H2, and some of it's maybe being pr or converted into water. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do to refine those branching ratios. Um, but what this seems to indicate is that a very small amount must be going into water. Otherwise, a Laddie would have seen a much larger water exosphere. However, the diurnal signature of the surface um, needs to have a bit of water being released. So it's still, we, we need better data sets to really understand. Any other questions for Dana? Can your models or your observations uh, distinguish uh, 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 a solar wind entrainment was the expression I was looking for. Yeah, so um, what I didn't show um, is that if you look at the exosphere and how it changes uh, when the moon's in the Earth's magnetotail versus when the moon is not in the Earth's magnetotail, you can really get a good idea of what um, the solar wind contribution is uh, to the exosphere. So. Uh, these are two scenarios, but uh, one is during um, when the moon's out in the solar wind and one when it's in the magnetotail. And you can see if you get a decrease in the overall exosphere, um, especially over in this region here, um, during full moon, then the solar wind is not going to contribute. I, I wasn't talking so much about contribution, oh. but, but loss due to solar wind entrainment. Oh, yeah, so, I mean, sputtering is going to, I mean, the solar wind's going to sputter volatiles out of the... No, but no. I, again, it's going to also, what's in the exosphere is going to be entrained in the solar wind as it goes by. Right, so that's included in the model. The, um, the exosphere can get ionized by um, photons, can get dissociated by photons, and it can get charge exchanged, ionized with the solar wind. And so anything that becomes an ion gets picked up and uh, carried away. But yeah, I've included the, that loss rate in the model. 
Um, can you make it very, very quick? I'll try. Uh, GPL, uh, Yang Liu from GPL. Um, so if we have a, a source and, uh, and not enough loss from the, uh, to the exosphere, so there must be some other things that available to capture those. So, you know, we know agglutinates have some, probably not enough. So I wonder, you know, what other form of sink there may be, um, you know, to capture. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And I think that, you know, doing some analysis in situ of the samples would be really, really good to understand, you know, the water that's actually, um, you know, hanging around and interacting with the rock. And I know Shui Li is doing some recent work looking at alteration uh, products from having water um, interacting with the regolith. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, the next talk, uh, still on the volatile theme, Endogenous Lunar Volatiles, The View from 50 Years After Apollo 11, uh, by Francis McCubbin, uh, Jessica Barnes, and I guess Yang Lu. The speaker is Francis. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank the co-conveners for inviting me here today to talk in this historic session. So I'm going to be talking today about endogenous lunar volatiles, the view uh, 50 years after Apollo. And uh, 11 minutes is certainly not enough time to go into all of the uh, endogenous lunar volatiles, so I'm mostly going to focus on the story of water, uh, water in the interior, which will complement nicely what we just heard from Dana about water on the surface. Uh, we do, however, cover uh, a large range of uh, volatiles in the moon in the New Views of the Moon chapter that's currently in review. Uh, the, the, my co-authors on this talk are the chapter leads for, for that our endogenous lunar volatiles chapter, and here are the contributors. And I'd also like to thank all of the other contributors that are not listed on the chapter but have added greatly to our knowledge of endogenous lunar volatiles over the last 50 years. So when Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin stepped onto the surface of the moon, they were greeted by a very dusty and desiccated world, uh, very dissimilar from, from what we have on Earth. Luckily, they were able to bring a bunch of rocks back, along with the following uh, other five Apollo missions. They brought back a total of 382 kilograms of material. And this material, along with the material brought back from the lunar missions, as well as a uh, few hundred lunar meteorites at this point, have really given us a, a foundation for understanding not just uh, science on the moon, but for solar system science across the board, as we'll hear about uh, this afternoon. And in addition, the 382 kilograms that were brought back, 80% of that material is actually still in a sort of pristine, as-received condition within the curatorial facilities. And I would argue that, that keeping these materials, once we put the investment in bringing them back, uh, storing them under the right conditions are what make discoveries like water on the moon that happened 40 years, almost 40 years after the samples were brought back, that's what makes this possible. And so as we continue to invest in sample return over the next decade, um, making sure that we, we curate those samples in a way that our grandchildren and, and their grandchildren can keep making new discoveries is, is critically important. So when the samples were first brought back and studied, as I said before, they were, they were unlike a lot of what we've seen in terrestrial rocks. There were a complete lack of hydrous minerals, uh, so no amphiboles, no biotites. There was no evidence of aqueous alteration textures, at least as we recognize them in, uh, in terrestrial rocks. There were metal grains that seemed to be primary igneous features of, of the rocks. They were pristine, and ferric iron was nearly absent. Um, there are a few uh, exceptions. And indigenous lunar water uh, was not definitively detected with the best analytical techniques of the day. Uh, it turns out they may have actually found indigenous lunar water, but they, they couldn't actually differentiate it from possible terrestrial contamination. And for those that dared to throw out a number, uh, from, the, from these earlier studies, uh, estimates were that the moon was bone dry with less than a part per billion water. So this, this is uh, many orders of magnitude drier than the Earth. Now, as I said before, the moon is not just depleted in, in water, which is, uh, hi hydrogen is a highly volatile element. If you look at uh, incompatible, uh, moderately volatile over refractory element ratios, 
in particular, uh, potassium uranium and potassium thorium, we have a lot of data across solar system bodies. The moon is highly depleted with respect to mo moderately volatiles as well. In fact, the, the only samples that are really a lot more depleted than the moon are the angrites. Now, we've heard a lot uh, earlier in this session and in sessions yesterday about uh, some of the reasons for this volatile depletion. And I'm not going to really go into those uh, in this talk, but there's usually arguments between whether it's a primary volatile depletion related to uh, nebular processes or uh, processes related to the giant impact itself. I think most models are sort of uh, leaning this way, but this is still a very active area of research. Now, the moon is not completely devoid of volatiles, and we've known this uh, from the beginning. We've, we've got numerous um, pyroclastic volcanic glasses that have been thought to have been volatile assisted in their eruptions. We've got highly vesiculated uh, basalts from a, a number of missions, uh, of the Apollo missions. And uh, even though there, there weren't sort of hydrous phases that we see like amphibole and mica, there are appetites which uh, can have hydroxyl in their structure, but also fluorine and chlorine. And the, the volatile assistant for the uh, pyroclastic uh, glasses had largely been thought to be carbon-related species. Um, and for appetite, most, uh, b based on the analytical techniques that were available, uh, fluorine and chlorine were thought to be the only components of the appetite crystal structure. And OH and H was not detected. Uh, with, with the best analytical techniques. Now, starting in, in LPSC of 2007, uh, there were a couple uh, groups that started um, kind of uh, cracking away at this, at this uh, initial idea. So Alberto Sal and group uh, reported low uh, water abundances in some of the volcanic glass beads. And another group um, uh, led, led by myself as a, as a grad student, actually, we, we reported missing components based on fluorine and chlorine analyses uh, by microprobe and lunar appetites, showing that there was a missing component that would bet most easily be explained by OH. So we reached a point in, in the uh, mid-2000s where the analytical techniques were actually capable of, of detecting what small amounts of hydrogen may be there. And these works sort of sparked a lot of interest and, and uh, reinvigorated vigoration and reassessing the uh, volatile content of the moon. So Alberto Sal's uh, study was published in 2008, and they found up to 50 ppm water in, in some of the glasses. And um, they also sh reported uh, zoning profiles within one of the beads that was consistent with uh, volatiles being lost, not being driven inward. And when these results were first published, they were somewhat controversial. These, these abundances are somewhat low. Um, the, the lab that they were doing these in at, at the geophysical lab uh, with Eric Cowry, uh, they, they were able to get much lower detection limits than some previous labs. But the, these water contents were, were quite low, and uh, people weren't quite sure what to make of it. And then in 2010, a pair of papers came out uh, within about a month of each other showing much higher abundances of OH, this time in lunar appetites, with up to 3,700 ppm water. And um, this sort of really got the ball rolling as far as, OK, we, we've got water in glasses. We've got water in appetite. There's, there's really something here. And a lot of uh, other samples started getting looked at. Um, in 2011, Eric Cowrie published uh, on melt inclusions within uh, <clears throat> these olivine hosts melt inclusions within the orange glass and found almost morb-like uh, water, uh, chlorine, and sulfur abundances. And this was amazing. This really um, kind of got everyone to start scratching their head. Wow, the, the, the moon could actually have as much water as the Earth. This is, this is amazing, considering how different the rocks look. <clears throat> um, but we didn't stop there. Uh, groups also started looking at anomaly and hydrous mineral phases. Uh, Heiju Hui looked at some ferroin and orthosite samples by micro FTIR, finding several ppm uh, water within those crystals. And <clears throat> subsequent studies that they followed up on uh, confirmed those measurements by SIMS. And uh, alkali feldspar in some of the alkali sweet rocks were also investigated by Ryan Mills. 
uh, finding, again, around 20 ppm water within the uh, feldspar. Um, there's still a lot of work going on in understanding mineral melt partitioning relationships for, uh, for feldspar and melt to understand what these water contents mean uh, as far as abundances in the moon. And in addition to the, the lunar sample studies that have, have told us a lot about water in the lunar interior, there have also been remote detections of, of OH from the surface, um, indicating the presence of hydrated minerals within Balealis Crater. This was work by Rachel Klima that came out in Nature Geoscience in 2013. And when we put all of this together, there's sort of two um, main groups of data sets that have been used to try to estimate water abundances in the moon from all of this work. Uh, a, a large one is coming from the, the melt inclusions, which have expanded beyond just the 74220, but also olivine melt inclusions, olivine hosted melt inclusions in a number of Mari basalts. And uh, after Eric's paper in 2011, there's also been a paper by Yang Chen and, and co authors in 2015, and a uh, most recent one by Peng Ni uh, in 2019, earlier this year in GCA. And on the basis of these data, they're, they're getting water. Uh, abundance estimates in the moon largely based on water cerium ratios in the range of about 84 to 292 ppm water. And uh, work on aptite has also continued through multiple groups and there's been a lot of experimental work on aptite melt partitioning uh, studies to understand how to use aptite as a magmatic hygrometer. We've made a lot of progress in that arena although it has not been very simple. And based on the aptite compositions in, in the rocks that are appropriate to use for, for aptite, we're getting estimates of about 1.2 to 14 ppm water for the lunar mantle. So what we're seeing is we've got two possible hygrometers. Both give a lot more water in the bulk moon than we've had previously estimated. Uh, but there's still a lot of disagreement here between you know, one in tens of ppm to high tens to hundreds of ppm. And so what we really need are uh, more analyses, and we also need more samples. Um, preferably samples that uh, sur sample a, a larger surface area of the moon. A lot of our samples are coming from uh, one area, at least the ones for which we have context, as we've heard in other talks. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what we do uh, in, in the coming years with this. And I think it's a very exciting time to be working on volatiles in the moon. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Dang. Great, great talk. Uh, the, uh, you may have two different sources and, and those are, as a result are very compatible. The uh, salts have been exposed to the admissibility immiscible iron sulfur liquid coming out at, during the magma ocean period before they were formed, and so you would have lost water as a, as a result of that. And, and, uh, but the uh, pyroclastics may be coming from much deeper through more primordial material. Right, yeah, and, and there are actually some really good reasons to think that the appetite estimates might be a bit too low because they are gonna be affected by late stage degassing of basalts. And, um, you know, until we understand the cerium distribution and, and other heterogeneities, it's, you know, the answer really could be anywhere in between. Mark. Okay, I've partially answered the question, but since I'm standing up here, um, when you go from the 100 to 300 ppm that was derived from the apar plastic materials to a bolt moon, um, I don't really know how you make that big leap because the uh, Orange glasses come from an area that we know is anomalously high in volatiles. So how do you step back from an enriched area to the bulk moon to get that confidence right. to say that's what is the bulk moon? Right, so the basis for a lot of that work is, is based on the similar compatibilities between, uh, similar behaviors uh, between water and cerium during magmatic processes. And so, the more volatile rich, water rich regions should also be higher in cerium. And so it's thought that that ratio shouldn't change very much. Now, this seems to work pretty well for Earth. I'd say there's still a little bit of work to do for the moon, but of, of the data we have, people have made a pretty convincing uh, argument that the partitioning behavior is the same. If you just look at the major lunar uh, mantle minerals, olivine, pyroxene, uh, Plagi clays, the water and cerium partitioning under, under lunar-like conditions are very similar to each other. Yeah. Hey, Chris.
quickly. Yeah, uh, Tim Fagan, Waseda University. Um, uh, nice talk, Francis. And um, let's see, I, my question regards the creep lithologies. And if there's water in the interior of the moon, water is, is incompatible as well as volatile. And as you know, the creep basalts are enriched in incompatible elements. Why are they so OH poor? Right. And so a lot of these estimates have to do with the uh, kind of bulk silicate moon prior to any degassing that happened in the late stage LMO. I think if we actually took what was there today in the, the water in the crustal rocks and the water in the mantle, it's going to be much less than these values because we've probably lost uh, hydrogen. But we're not, you don't really account for that in this process because you're not losing cerium. And so because these estimates are based on the original serum, it's really linked to the original water, not the present day water in those rocks. All right, thank you very much, Francis. Okay, we'll move on to our next talk. Titled The Lunar Regolith is Understood from Near and Far. The authors are Genevi, Costello, Ghent, Glotch, Greenhagen, and others, and the speaker is Brett Genevi. All right, thank you. I'm honored to be talking about the lunar regolith, uh, the best part of the moon since we are all picking favorites. The um, regolith is really all of the fragmental material that overlies a more coherent substrate. So it's all of the soil, all of the rocks that overlie the bedrock on the moon. And um, one of the key goals of some of the precursor missions was to understand the lunar regolith. And so I, I'm just making sure to highlight these because it these are part of the Apollo program, really. These precursor missions that, missions that included the Ranger impactors, the surveyor landers, the lunar orbiters that gave us this really amazing data set um, to make sure that astronauts could land safely on the moon and operate safely on the moon. And of course, with this you know, exploration data set, science and exploration go hand in hand. And so we knew actually a lot about the regolith before those first boot prints were left um, in the soil. And it was you know, generally agreed upon, with a few notable exceptions, what that character was and proven out by these landings. But of course, um, it was the samples of the regolith and their geologic context that really revealed a whole set of processes that are unique to um, airless bodies across the solar system. And can just see um, what this regolith really looks like um, once you sieve it out, so you can see a, a size fraction here. This is the 125 to 250 micron grain fraction here. And it's just this treasure trove of um, minerals, lithic fragments, uh, glasses, agglutinates, that tell the story of uh, how the moon formed, how the crust formed, and then how it evolved over time. So how did the regolith form? Um, early on, as, as we heard about already some this morning, um, it was regolith formation was really dominated by these enormous impact events um, that left, you know, thick kilometers thick deposits of regolith, um, or what we call mega regolith. And that is what we saw in the grail data as well with this very porous upper crust, and that is uh, the mega regolith. As you know, impact bombardment, um, these larger impacts became uh, rare. Um, you know, impact events of smaller sizes, much more frequent events continued. This is just an example of a 10 micron size crater on a lunar soil grain. And so this continual reworking of the regolith, commuting it to finer grain sizes, um, continues you know, today. More recently, another process has recognized that it likely is important on the moon as well, and that is um, thermal fatigue. You can see a boulder tracks here, where a couple of boulders apparently rolled down a slope. And then when you zoom in on those, you can see that they have essentially fallen apart on the surface there. Um, so this might be an example of what that kind of thermal fatigue would do, where you have the extreme temperature cycles on the moon that promote cracking um, and fracturing of materials and just also help to break down the regolith into smaller and smaller size fractions. 
Um, but the regolith is not just uh, destruction by impacts. It's really um, a cycle. It's a steady state cycle of um, creation and destruction. So you have the creation of um, rocks from the regolith. These are the regolith breaches where impact events, the pressure and temperatures take your soil and lithify it, create a new rock. And that was found mostly, um, for example, here at Van Serg Crater, where the regolith breaches, um, you know, they can be of all kinds of strengths, but the ones here were friable enough that the astronauts could crush them in their hands. Um, you turn up the temperature even more, and you can get impact melt, where rock, the regolith or rocks are completely remelted. This is an example of a river of impact melt that flowed outside of the rim of Tycho Crater and is now solidified into new rocks. So nearly um, the entire surface of the moon is this more fragmental, um, fine-grained regolith. But where you do see the rocks is at fresh craters uh, because of these uh, exposure of new rocks from, bed from bedrock and creation of new rocks as well. And so um, those rocks degrade through this impact process in this ongoing cycle. And they degrade in a way that um, has been tied to uh, the length of time. They sit on the surface. And so this is a new way we have now, a new tool to date impact craters uh, because there is such a good relationship between the formation of the crater and then how long it takes for those rocks to degrade over time. And we can look at that here um, as we slowly fade from reflectance, looking at Giordano Bruno crater, into rock abundance. Um, and you can just see how this crater, this young, one of the youngest craters on the moon, really stands out in rock abundance. Another thing you might notice, though, is here at Mare Crisium. You can just see the outline of Mare Crisium based on all of these pinpricks of rocky craters that dot Mare Crisium. When you get out to the highlands, the regolith is so thick that you um, impact events can't really penetrate through it to expose uh, new rocks. But because these volcanic uh, plains formed after the heaviest bombardment, the regolith is thinner. And you can tell that from all of these small craters that uh, excavate through to uh, bedrock below the regolith. So this is one of the ways we've looked at um, understanding uh, regolith stratigraphy, how thick the regolith is. There are other morphologic ways that really came a lot, were pioneered in the lunar orbiter images. Um, another, just to show how amazing the Apollo program really was, was the um, active seismic experience. We heard about the passive experiments from Rene. Um, the active seismic experiments were on Apollo 14. 16 and 17, and this is the mortar launcher from Apollo 16. Um, so they actually, the astronauts carried along explosives. Um, three mortar shells were lobbed, um, lobbed explosive charges nearly a kilometer away. Those were detonated after the astronauts left the surface. But um, it, it gave you this um, amazing profile of the um, uppermost um, stratigraphy of that regolith. And for a lot of reasons, these numbers are, are pretty uncertain and kind of give you a, a conservative estimate of how thick the regolith is. But the canonical values have been that there's three to five meters of regolith in the Mare, 10 to 12 meters of regolith in the highlands. Uh, more recently at the Chang'e 3 landing site, the U-2 rover carried a ground penetrating radar and that actually gave a, a new look at that regolith stratigraphy, where they found that the regolith was actually four to eight times thicker than some of those previous kinds of estimates would have predicted, um, suggesting that the regolith accumulation rate is actually substantially higher. So this is a really uh, important new piece to include in our understanding of the regolith. Um, I'll briefly touch on space weathering, one of the ways that the regolith evolves. Um, and one of my favorite topics, there's been an entire session going on this morning. Um, if it's also one of your favorite topics, hopefully you saw some of those talks. But space weathering is the process by which um, bright, fresh material exposed on the lunar surface becomes darker, evolves with time until it matches what we know as the mature background regolith. 
And so that happens through a series of chemical and physical changes that happen when the regolith is exposed uh, to the surface. It's altered by the solar wind and by micrometeorite bombardment so that all the soil grains end up with these rims or coatings um, that affect the way that uh, they, the soil grains reflect and interact with light. Um, also important, as a soil sits on the surface, uh, fresh uh, rocks, minerals, um, are turned into agglutinates, these glassy blebs of material um, that make up over half of mature soils and can also tell us a lot about um, the history of material on the surface. So all of this goes into the way that uh, light is reflected. Really now we know from more recent data the way it's reflected from the far UV, visible, near infrared, and even affects out into uh, the thermal infrared. So it has profound um, importance for the way we look at our remote sensing data. Uh, regolith gardening is also kind of part of this space weathering process. It works to expose fresh material to the surface where it's weathered and then buried also in a, a dynamic kind of cycle. So um, one of the uh, really important new results comes from the uh, looking at images of the surface um, collected both before and after the formation of new impact craters. So you can see blinking here the formation of a new 12 meter impact crater. If you take the ratio of those two images, you can really see the way um, the surface has been affected by this impact event. And so this is just a small 12 meter crater, but one of the really um, surprising and important findings is just how profound of effects it has on the surface going out to very great distances. This 12 meter crater has affected the surface thousands of meters away from the crater. And so that has led to this interpretation that because of this reworking from this distal uh, ejecta, you're getting a regolith gardening that is over 100 times faster than previously thought. And one of the things I loved about this work from Spire et al. is that once they had this finding, they were able to go back and look at the Apollo samples and look at the cores and see in the cosmogenic uh, short-lived radionuclides evidence for this rapid gardening. So it's really exciting that we are opening these new uh, untouched samples because we can look at them with fresh eyes in the way this study did and ask new kinds of questions that weren't necessarily posed at the time. Um, all of this work has been able um, to be turned into models of how uh, frequently the regolith is turned over at varying depths. All right, so this leads just to a quick overview of what I think are some of you know, the most important questions that we can answer by looking at the regolith. And they are varied because the regolith is such a broad topic. You know, it is uh, the source of all of our samples. It uh, covers essentially the entire moon and it's the source of nearly all of our remote sensing data. So one of the things we want to look at is seeing regolith in situ with bedrock. We have never been able to examine up close in detail the way that regolith transitions down into the rocks that, from which it was formed. We want to look at the far side uh, regolith. This far side regolith or mega regolith is really containing this amazing history of the feldspathic highlands terrain that we have not yet explored. Um, paleoregolith is also a really important um, goal to return samples of paleoregolith, and now we know where paleoregolith might be found. This is regolith that formed early in the moon's history and was buried, such as by a lava flow you can see in these uh, lunar pits, and um, preserves a history of you know, the ancient sun, the early solar system, and how that uh, would have been a different environment. The polar regolith, it's really important that we understand the geotechnical properties of the polar regolith if we are ever to extract volatiles as resources from that material. And you know, as we heard from Dana, to understand the way that volatiles can migrate through the regolith. And then last here, um, space weathering. There are so much we don't understand about space weathering, including the interplay between the solar wind and micrometeoroid bombardment 
as well as unusual areas like the lunar swirls um, where space weathering seems to be following a different path. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brett. I think uh, we are actually out of time, so we'll, we'll <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so this brings us to our last uh, talk of the session, which is titled 10 Years of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, Advancing oh, Lunar Science and Context for Future Lunar Exploration. The authors are Petro, Keller, Cohen, and McClanahan, and the talk will be given by Noah Petro. So if we learned about the, the pie crust and the filling, does that make LRO the cherry on top? <laughs> Brett, as always, gave a really awesome talk, and I was really pleased to see the context that she gave about the history of lunar missions, including some of the early robotic explorers. I took this figure from the LPI website that has sort of the, the timeline of lunar missions, both landed and orbital missions, as well as the Ranger impactors, the litho breakers, if you will. There was the early decade, the this late 50s and early and 1960s, kind of the precursor to Apollo. The 70s as the sort of the realization of Apollo, the full manifestation of what Apollo could do. There was the quiet period, the 1980s. And then this slow buildup through the, the 90s and into the first part of this century, the 2000s, with more and more lunar missions. And of course, 10 years ago, the arrival of LRO on orbit at the moon. I'm gonna focus uh, the first part of my talk on, on some, a little bit of this early history and then get into what LRO is doing and then what happens, as most NASA talks do, talking about what happens on the right side of the timeline. But our dates aren't gonna slip. So I think the, the return of the first images of the far side of the moon, as Steve Allardo alluded to in his talk this morning, uh, really kind of set the moon into the, the 20th century. Even these grainy, low-resolution images revealed the the diversity of the far side, or at least the, the lack of diversity compared to the near side, uh, on the far side. Nearly simultaneously with this was the, the advent of these rectification of the Earth-based telescopic images that uh, Hartman and Kuiper did, uh, basically projecting Earth images onto a sphere and then putting your camera right above the, the limb. And so you know, we literally got to look past the, the far side and the far side, and then we started trying to peer into the, the far side, at least along the limb, to see the, the majestic rims, rings of, of Oriental Basin. So you know, as these early studies and, and analyses of, of both robotic uh, and telescopic data, that began to reveal the, the true nature of the moon beyond just what was visible from, from the near side. The lunar orbiter missions, of course, returned a really valuable data set, not only in identifying where to go with Apollo, but where also there are some interesting features. This, this is a, the image that was recalled the image of the century, at least at that point. Carly, in her office at Brown, has a, a huge print of this on her wall, and I spend a lot of time in our meetings listening to Carly, but staring at this picture. <laughs> and she'd always point out that you know, the, the Earth-based telescopic data that she worked so hard to collect uh, saw that there was olivine, and she assumed that this, what she called the dike in the, the center of, of the central peak of uh, Copernicus, uh, contained that olivine. It was an interesting correlation, and I really thought, wow, this is great. Eventually, someday, we'll be able to maybe get a mission that actually reveals that in its true character. And of course, with LRO, we've re realized that. Um, but you know, Lunar Orbiter did a lot in getting prepared for, for, for our human exploration of the moon. It also provided a really kind of valuable data set that has stood the test of time for over 50 years now, not just in preparing uh, identification of, of landing sites, but giving us a context. That's a word that we've heard a few times today, and I think it's important to remember that the context that we get from orbital data sets, including orbital images, is valuable in assessing all of the other data that we've heard presented today. Um, the figure at the right shows that the coverage of the various lunar orbiter missions, either in some of the high resolution images as well as the almost complete near and far side images. And as someone who, who used the few, very few oblique images taken by Lunar Orbiter 5 of the interior of SPA, you know, it was tantalizing, the information that was presented there. You'd see, is it a crater, is it a boulder? I don't know, but it's something. And then you write a paper and try to do your best with what you had. But that was it, really, for, for high resolution images with you know, oblique images, um, uh, you know, Clementine provided high phase angle images that was really hard to suss out 
morphology. So for decades, Lunar Orbiter was it, and it was a great, great uh, data set. We've heard about the Apollo samples, but it's important to remind ourselves of the observations, the measurements that were made in orbit. Um, over the Apollo missions to the moon, Apollo 8, 10 through 17, over 30,000 photographs were, were taken of the surface, some handheld cameras, some automated cameras. During the, the government shutdown, um, I, perhaps in violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act, was flipping through the Apollo 8 orbital images, as one does. <laughs> and I came across this, and I thought, wow, I guess the 60s were pretty wild time. <laughs> but what it was was an experiment. Now, unfortunately, the experiment didn't work quite as well as it had been planned, but there was a, a, an attempt to take um, basically a multi-ratio image by placing a filter in front of black and white film. The crew inadvertently used color film, and so we have red moon and blue moon, which sounds like a great kid's book. Um, so the experiment, of, the experiment may have failed, but the, the initiative there to take the advantage of the opportunity in lunar orbit was clear. Uh, by Apollo 17, of course, uh, we had Jack in orbit, and this is an image he took using a handheld Hasselblad color film. Uh, and after the discovery of the orange soil, he set about the idea of trying to find other exposures of orange. Ron Evans had reported that he thought he had seen orange soil or orange colors in orbit, and so Jack wanted to independently verify it, worrying that Ron had, had kind of become convinced that there must be orange there somewhere. And so Jack took a handful of images, particularly near Scopelius Gallus. Uh, this is an image that he and Ron Wells have, have color corrected, and this is in a, a print-only abstract, uh, 1213, uh, at this LPSC. I think what the, the sum total of the Apollo uh, images reveal, though, is that there's still a wealth of information to be gleaned from these data sets. And I'd encourage all the early career people in the audience to not ignore the, the date the image was captured, but more the content that's within it. 50 years, and, and the, the data is still as, as important and critical in our assessment of the moon as ever. There were beautiful oblique images. This is an uh, image taken by Apollo 10 of King Crater, revealing some, some tantalizing albedo differences uh, along the northern rim. And of course, the, the low sun angle images taken by many of the missions, including Apollo 6, 17, which Jim wrote about in the Apollo 17 preliminary science report. There's also the TB images taken by the crews, and I, I compare what was shown on Apollo 8 from their first orbit to an actual TV broadcast, live TV broadcast from the far side of the moon by Apollo 17 after trans-Earth injection. They're far enough above the moon to be in line of sight with the Earth and actually televising to the, well, unfortunately probably not, but millions of people on Earth actually seeing the far side of the moon live on TV in color. So then Apollo ended, unfortunately, pr prematurely. And there was a question uh, posed at the post-Apollo Lunar Science Workshop in July of 1972 of what to do next. And I mean, you could pretty much copy and paste this, as I did, to talk about what LRO is doing. And so they set out the, the, the goal that a subsequent orbital mission, high inclination, polar orbit, should contain photographic, compositional, radioactive, and other remote sensing systems to really produce a comp comprehensive survey of the moon. I'm glad they didn't talk about how long that mission should last, because I'm sure they wouldn't have thought that a mission going 10 years would have been something that would be even feasible. I'd also like to point out a paper that Wendell Mendel wrote for the, uh, the LRO special volume uh, right around the time of launch that goes into the, the, the gory history of false starts and stops for, for making this type of mission a reality. And I'd like to think that LRO has filled this role. What LRO has done, and I think it's important to remind ourselves, is particularly in context of the presentations that we've seen today, is provide that valuable geologic context for almost every observation that we've heard described here today. So I took one of Carly's slides that she uh, graciously shared with me from a work from Leah Cheek. Leah, in her paper, shows the, the source of some of these beautiful anorthosidic uh, plagioclase absorption features along one of the, the, the mounds in the ring of, uh, inner ring of, of Oriental. Um, but really what, what's spectacular is not just that you can see, okay, it's associated with this mound, but you can actually see the boulders in, in our rock images that, that really are giving sign to, to that compositional signature. This large boulder here is about 30 meters in diameter. It's about the size of this room. So we know, let's go get that rock. Let's send, you know, let's send the future generation to that boulder to get a sample. Let's send the future generation to 
collect the, the regolith in locations that Brett talked about to inform our understanding of, of uh, regolith processes. We also can put, as, as we've alluded to before, the samples that we have collected and are about to understand and un open into sort of a 21st century context. In the paper that Jack uh, led a few years ago, we, we looked at the uh, NAC images, the ROC NAC images of, of station six and seven, identified the, the boulder at station seven, and tied those boulders to potential source crops up the North Massif, giving those samples new context in the, the region and indeed in the whole moon for where they may have come from. Here at LPSC, we have a number of uh, presentations and abstracts, some of which you have to go back in time to see, some that you can see uh, tomorrow in posters and, and later on in this week, uh, that, that really give a new light to these Apollo measurements, whether it's through new geologic mapping or new interpretations of their, of their context. So let's talk a little bit about LRO for a moment, or a few moments anyway. Uh, on Friday, we were very fortunate to submit uh, the fourth extended mission proposal to NASA headquarters to continue LRO for at least three more years. This is where everybody applauds. <laughs> this is really the first time I've had a chance to take a deep breath in a long, long time. Uh, one of the things that we struggled with, well, not really struggled with, but really you know, worked really hard on is to how do you couch a fourth extended mission, a fourth version of this mission in something that's new and compelling. So I turn to, to some of the sources that give me most time to ponder in my life, because the fourth in a series is always the best. <laughs> we knew that we couldn't take our spacecraft and send it back in time to, to bring back whales, but we could take the cast of characters that we all know and love, namely the instruments, and put them into a different context. I also turn to another source of inspiration, and I'll let you decide who's who on that, calendar, on that poster. I don't think I'm Darth Vader. I think I'm trying to become more like Chewbacca. But <laughs> you take a cast of characters who have a backstory, who have history, and put them into an environment where they can flourish and tell a story. And so that's where we go with ESM-4, our fourth extended science mission, where we take the sum knowledge that we have over our precursor missions, the, the previous extended missions, our prime science mission, and indeed all the missions that came before it. I like to call Apollo the best precursor missions LRO could ever ask for. <laughs> we take that information and we build a new story, a new quest for information around that. And so with ESM-4, we identify several key themes and questions that we will effort to answer in our third extended mission. We're entering new uncharted territory, another Star Trek reference. Uh, of how long we've been at the moon. We've been at the moon now for over 120 lunations, 120 days. By the time the fourth extended mission starts, we'll be 140 lunations. And what that allows us to do is understand those processes, those regolith processes, the volatiles processes, that, that really take time to unravel. We're gonna keep our orbit relatively simple by, by allowing uh, Mother Nature to, uh, to keep us uh, without using any fuel in an in a, in a, a oblique, uh, I'm sorry, an elliptical orbit with the low periaps, which is gradually increasing away from the South Pole but getting closer over the North Pole over the three years of our extended mission. Um, we have ample fuel to, to get us through ESM-4 and as well as go on for about seven more years after this. So we look forward to giving another talk at a future LPSCs about all the great successes of our mission. Um, we look at volatiles, and there's a number of presentations that are going on here today. Wes gave a really excellent overview about our, our volatiles questions for ESM-4. Um, we look at the diurnal variability of volatiles. Uh, we talked about that in, in some of uh, um, Dana's work, and Kathy had a poster last night about that. We also look at uh, the various expressions of volcanism. Uh, certainly one of the most exciting areas that we've gotten into is looking at uh, how uh, silicic volcanism is manifested in silicic uh, maybe uh, um, subsurface silicic exposures are brought up by, by impact craters, as well as potentially some active uh, movement along faults and looking at the, the block populations around, along uh, wrinkle ridges, and as well as the, the wonderful regolith and impacts uh, that, that really uh, continue to occur every day. And, and Emerson gave an outstanding talk on Monday about the search for new impact, impact craters, including using WAC images to do that. We had uh, incredible success in getting publications out over the last, well, whole 10 years, but most recently, uh, Amanda Hendricks's paper on using the new mode for LAMP to uh, uh, constrain diurnal variability, as well as the paper by 
uh, Sarah Missouri uh, in science earlier this year, uh, looking at the, the impact rate on the moon and Earth, and uh, no, no, noting an uh, increase in impacts over the last about 300 million years. So LRO is, is a mission that's going on today, but we really look to the future. Uh, we are supporting the commercial landers for finding safe landing sites. Our science team is productive. We have 300 peer-reviewed pr publications as of now. Uh, Tom Waters, as always, just had two papers accepted in the last week, so our numbers go up uh, every day. 40% of our uh, papers are led by students and early career authors. That's really important. We have uh, a whole new crop of lunar explorers, uh, and with the selection of the Apollo sample analysis teams, uh, a real, I think, excellent opportunity for, for the next generation to start leading us into that generation. I want to highlight this picture uh, taken by the uh, Iraq NAC. This was uh, acquired on July, January 31st of this year, showing between the arrows the, the Chang'e 4 landing site. This was an important image. It was the first uh, slewed observation that LRO had made in about a year. So we're getting back to slewed observations uh, and uh, couldn't be happier about that. So this is the Apollo 11 landing site, imaged by LROC uh, several years ago. And I think it's important to remind ourselves not just what we learned from Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, but also that, as we've said before, these are the gifts that keep on giving. They drive some of the questions that we effort to ask with LRO, um, and you know, I couldn't be more excited about the future that we have before us for the next three years and beyond. We are happy to be here and can't wait to uh, see the exciting things to come. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are over time, so I'm going to let you go. But um, look forward to seeing you all at the 100th anniversary of Apollo, at the 100th LPSC, which will, of course, take place on the moon. And thank you to all our speakers for a fantastic session. Thank you, the AV guy. Oh, yes, and the AV guy.